Doug, are you ready for us? Yeah, we had uh, established, you know, as a Hellenic Forum was... Uh, uh, I can't hear you right now. You, you've muted yourself. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, I can hear you now. All right, give me one second. Okay. I'm going to hear everything. We changed the bit. He's an opportunist. Ah. <laughs> Good. One second. You know, because they actually yeah. are doing in the field what you are talking about. Sure. Just one there you go. Oh my gosh! No way, man! Oh, it's, whoa! Here goes my speech. We cannot do a power while Doug is on, right? Okay. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't, didn't respond. Yeah, yeah. Didn't respond to your email. I didn't respond to your email. Come on, Shimon. Started here in a minute. I have new information. No, no, he doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. No, there's no, there's no connection. Here. There's no mic. He can hear you. Hello, Doug. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. This is Ephraim. Hello, Doug. How are you, Ephraim? No complaints. <laughs> you are speaking in the first, first panel. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay. So why don't you have a seat? We need to get. Find that I can speak from there. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. Yeah. We need Dan. Not on panel. I'm just. No, no, it's okay. <clears throat> when I finish, we'll go out and talk. We're almost ready to go, but we're looking for Dan. Oh, very awesome. I'm here. Dan, he's here. Oh, there he is. <clears throat> Please come up and have a have a seat. Will. I will. You're gonna, you're gonna sit there, I guess. Can I be heard? You, uh, can you hear me? Sort of. Are we mic'd? I mean, we're good to go. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to a conference sponsored by Hudson Institute, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies, and B'nai B'rith International. I'm Seth Cropsey, senior fellow at Hudson and director of the of Hudson Center for American Sea Power. I'm going to turn the floor over to Dan Mariashin for some opening words. These are my opening words. <coughs> He'll be followed by Professor Ephraim Inbar, president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security. Uh, Professor, Professor Inbar earned his doctoral degree uh, at the excellent political science department at the University of Chicago. His area of specialization is <coughs> in strategic studies and the politics and strategy of Israeli national security. He also served in the Israeli Defense Forces as a paratrooper. Uh, Dan is, uh, Mariashin is CEO of B'nai B'rith International. During his career at B'nai B'rith, Mr. Mariashin also represented his organization as part of delegations around the world. 
He's lectured on foreign and defense affairs at the U.S. State Department's Foreign Service Institute and the Marine Corps Command and Staff College. Um, Dan, if you would, would offer some remarks. And after that, Professor Inbar, if you would, uh, if I am. And then uh, our first panel will look at security challenges in the Eastern Mediterranean, and I will introduce the panel in a moment. Thank you, Seth. Nabrith is uh, pleased to join with the Hudson Institute <laughs> and JISS in sponsoring this uh, important and timely program. Uh, as they say, timing is everything. Uh, at this moment in time, there is an urgency about addressing the chaos that is roiling the Eastern Mediterranean, the ramifications of which are being felt, of course, way beyond the region. From the point at which we are meeting today, looking north, south, east, and west, there is good reason to be deeply concerned. Civil wars, proxy wars, ethnic rivalries, religiously inspired terrorism, naval buildups, big and medium power on the ground involvement, and contentiousness even among allies as to how to act and react, fill out a lengthy list of flashpoints that command our daily attention. Where exactly do you begin to address this multiplicity of challenges? Today's program will allow us to hear not only analysis, but the opportunity as well to explore options for addressing these current crises. For us, gathered here today, there is a context, or should I say contexts, to our discussions. The exploration and exploitation of uh, natural gas reserves has served as a springboard for cooperation and collaboration amongst Israel, Greece, and Cyprus, now being joined at various points along the way by Egypt, Jordan, and others. Add to that trade, tourism, and cooperation on innovation initiatives, and you see a real-time transformation in the region. The growing interest of the Trump administration in these developments has added tremendous weight to their importance. And with regard to the United States, the Russia factor, the Iran factor, what was the ISIS and Al-Qaeda factor, and perhaps again the, uh, the ISIS factor, all contribute to the complexities of challenges that we are facing. Other relationships impact the security situation as well, the role or non-role of NATO, issues affecting US relationships in the Gulf, even debates within the US and its two political parties over involvement in the crises abroad, and the always present Greek-Turkish situation involving two American allies are additional ingredients in this geopolitical mixing bowl that bring us together today. One final note about B'nai B'rith and its historic interest in this region. This year, our organization is celebrating its 176th anniversary, making it the oldest of the international Jewish organizations. Depending on the point in that long span of history, we were among the most active Jewish organizations in the Ottoman Empire, in places like Greece and elsewhere in the Balkans, in Egypt, even in Sudan at one point, Lebanon, and Syria. In pre-state Israel, our first branch was established in Jerusalem in 1888. Indeed, the first secretary of that branch was none other than Eliezer ben Yehuda, the father of the modern Hebrew language. Finally, we are fortunate that our JISS colleagues with whom we have partnered with over the years, in addition to their own highly respected expertise and the Hudson Institute and its very important and insightful professionals have brought together an array of experts and analysts from the worlds of academia, diplomacy, and the military to assess the problems and prospects of the threats and challenges before us. A special thank you to Doug Fife, to Seth Cropsey, Ephraim Inbar, and Iran Lerman for their special efforts uh, to bring us today's program, and also to Irving Silver, who chairs the B'nai B'rith Foundation, for his generosity in helping today's conference to take place. Thank you. Okay, shalom to everybody. I uh, am very happy to bring you greetings from Jerusalem, uh, the eternal capital of the Jewish people, uh, which was finally recognized also by the United States. 
and uh, uh, the uh, JISS, the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and uh, Security, has uh, devoted uh, much time to the Eastern Mediterranean. This is one of the subjects we are specializing and uh, focusing on. And of course, uh, I'm very happy that uh, we could partner uh, with uh, the Hudson Institute and Bnei Brit uh, to uh, be able to bring uh, to the Washington uh, crowd, Washington <coughs> uh, people, uh, you know, our insights. I think it's an important subject. And uh, I wish uh, all of ourselves, all, all of us, to have a fruitful uh, conference. Thank you. <laughs> so, our first panel uh, will look at security challenges in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, participating in this panel are me. Um, I will be followed by Ephraim Inbar, who I've already introduced, who will offer a strategic assessment of the Eastern Mediterranean. <coughs> After Professor Inbar's remarks, Dr. Chai Eitan Cohen Kanarachak. Kanarachak? Yes, we'll discuss Turkey. Uh, Dr. Yanarachak analyzes Turkish politics and foreign policy at JISS. He received his doctorate from the Tel Aviv University School of History and is a lecturer at the same institution and also at the Ben Gurion University of Negev. Following uh, his presentation, we will hear from Doug Feith, right over there, except he's in Jerusalem. Uh, who will talk about the about Russia through um, uh, the video hookup? Doug is a senior fellow here at Hudson Institute. He works on foreign and defense issues such as terrorism, arms control, national security, policy making. Uh, Mr. Feith is writing a history of the Arab-Israeli issues. Um, during his distinguished career thus far. He has served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy uh, for President George W. Bush and in prior administrations as well. Um, after the presentations, um, we will have a question period um, followed by a second panel on opportunities in Middle East security. I will introduce that panel uh, to you at that time um, so that uh, there's no question about who um, is speaking to you. Um, we do have a distinguished group of speakers on a subject that is, uh, as Professor Inbar pointed out, timely. Uh, in the sense that its challenges are as dangerous as they are important and omnipresent. It is a, a modern conceit to believe that we as humans can impose without difficulty our will on the world. Modern science has divested nature of its animate character. We therefore expect that the only constraint upon our desires is our own power and strength. This is expressed in economics as clearly as it is in foreign policy. Creative destruction suggests a continuous generation of competitive enterprises that necessarily displace and eliminate order, uh, older, weaker, less efficient economic actors, all for the benefit of the whole. This effect is magnified when considering the great financial titans of our modern day global economy. These organizations have become so massive that their institutional death is a functional impossibility, at least in theory. Because of their wealth, they have achieved a sort of temporal immortality. Forgive the slip, or so it is thought. <coughs> it took the concerted action of an even larger donor, the United States government, to save those too big to fail entities from collapse. 
So we apply similar reasoning to foreign policy, particularly in the Western world, at the heart of the most impressive political projects since ancient Rome. American founders created and subsequent seminal leaders renewed a domestic political system that facilitated the accumulation of wealth and power without descending into empire. Europe obtained the revolutionary rights of man at the price of continental conquest. Napoleon was disposed to abandon representation in France's nominal sister republics, trading humane political life for imperial expediency. The British Empire's command of the global commons brought untold benefits to mankind, but it took its post-1945 collapse to create three of the world's staunchest defenders of liberal values, along with history's largest democracy. By contrast, alongside America stand a coalition of free, independent states, largely representative, which provide the US with access and support in return for the defense of their common interests. The US and its allies are some of the wealthiest and most free polities in human history because of this uniquely benevolent system. But America, like any other great power, must confront the demands of geography, politics, and economics. The Roman Empire operated a system of fortifications running the length of the modern Franco-German border for 400 years as a bulwark against hostile German tribes. Indeed, first century enmity between Rome and Germania runs remarkably parallel to 19th and 20th century enmity between France and Germany. History contains numerous similar geopolitical repetitions, but in the Western world, a recurring geopolitical theme is more apparent than the importance of the maritime Middle East. Roughly, this region runs from Sicily and Malta in the West to the Mediterranean's eastern shore and includes modern Egypt and Libya, Anatolia, Greece, and the Levant. The region lies at the intersection of the old world's hemispheres, Europe and North Africa on the one hand and Asia on the other. The first struggle was between Greek and Persian empires. Uh, Persia's dominance of Aetolia, Attica, the Peloponnese, and the Greek islands would have secured for them the Mediterranean's unparalleled maritime wealth. Several centuries later, a rising Rome chose to conquer the entirety of the maritime Middle East, a fact that secured the Pax Romana and enabled Roman longevity despite increasing internal instability. Thus, over 600 years after Rome's collapse, the Italian city-states Venice foremost among them developed a stranglehold over the maritime Middle East. Even with the discovery of the New World, the maritime Middle East remained the critical artery of Eurasian imperial power. The Ottomans rose and fell with their ability to control the region. Britain's Second Empire required a benign maritime Middle East long before the discovery of oil. During both World Wars and the Cold War, relevant competing coalitions strove to access the region or deny access to an adversary. The historical trend reflects a set of geopolitical facts that irritate contemporary sensibilities. Nevertheless, they must be identified and understood if the United States hopes to, hopes to conduct a coherent global strategy. First, these facts stem from the maritime Middle East geography. As previously, as I noted a moment ago, the Eastern Mediterranean and its terrestrially neighboring territories remain the critical link between Europe and Asia. 90% of the world's trade is carried on ships. Long before the Suez Canal opened, the Eastern Mediterranean was a global commercial nexus. The overland Silk Road terminated at Levantine and Anatolian ports, while maritime trade routes to and from India and China ran through the Red Sea. The Suez Canal and global petroleum demands have only intensified the maritime Middle East's economic importance. The Suez carries 13% of global maritime trade 
and 9% of seaborne petroleum trade. By geographical accident, the majority of known global oil reserves are held by Middle Eastern countries. Out of OPEC's 82% share of oil reserves, Middle Eastern countries hold 65%. It's true that North American energy resources have decreased the U.S.'s reliance on Middle Eastern oil, and moreover, that growing U.S. energy exports may decrease European dependency on Middle Eastern energy. However, Asian nations are the world's largest oil importers. Of the top five global oil importers by dollar value, four, China, India, Japan, and South Korea, lie on the Asian continent. Eight of Japan's top 15 oil providers are Middle Eastern. Of equal importance, at least, is Chinese oil dependency. The Communist Party has attempted to diversify China's energy portfolio, investing in renewables, and has used its growing entente with Russia to decrease its reliance on Middle Eastern oil. Moreover, coal is still China's primary energy source. Nevertheless, seven of China's top 15 oil providers are Middle Eastern, including three of the top five, second-ranked Saudi Arabia, fourth-ranked Iraq, and fifth-ranked Oman. If General Secretary Xi Jinping hopes to stave off domestic unrest caused by slowing economic growth, he must ensure a steady energy supply. A disruption in oil imports could jeopardize internal Chinese stability. The same geographic factors that dictate the maritime Middle East's economic importance shape its strategic relevance. By necessity, the United States is a global maritime power. It strives to maintain a favorable European-Eurasian balance of power, denying any empire or coalition dominance over the Eurasian landmass. Britain, the US's naval antecedent, chose to react to Eurasian political developments, remaining aloof until a crisis developed. The US's strategy of forward presence, despite its current material costs, is undeniably more <coughs> effective. America maintains a network of bases along the Eurasian rimland, and through its continental allies, enjoys unparalleled access to Eurasia's heartland for an insular power. The maritime Middle East is the fulcrum upon which this strategy pivots. Without secure sea lines of communication and supply, coordination between the US's European and Pacific allies would be virtually impossible. As Britain discovered during the Second World War, transferring forces around the Cape of Good Hope is hazardous. Politics and religion add another layer of importance to the maritime Middle East. The US can count Israel as a strategic on partner on par with the United Kingdom, Canada, and Japan. Indeed, Israel's independent military capabilities have been central in securing joint U.S.-Israeli interests since the beginning of the Cold War. Moreover, Israel is the U.S.'s only ideological partner in the region. While certain Arab states, Jordan in particular, have reformed their political systems, Israel remains the region's only democracy. Additionally, the religious competition for control of the Islamic world warrants American attention. Uh, there will be more said about this later in, the, in, the, in this panel. Turkey is divided between neo-Ottomans and those who have embraced Western representative government. By contrast, Iran fields a battle-hardened expeditionary warfighting force which blends irregular capabilities with shrewd on-the-ground diplomacy. The preponderance of geographic, political, economic, and strategic factors argues against the extrication that previous US, US administrations have hoped for. The foreign <coughs> policy is not made in a static environment. Other powers confront the same mix of geopolitical factors as the United States and navigate them with their own interests in mind. 
We'll hear more about Russia later in this panel. Uh, while the Baltic states and Ukraine receive most of the public's attention, Putin's strategy actually centers around the Eastern Mediterranean, again, for reasons that I expect you will hear shortly uh, from other members of the panel. Finally, while China has yet to extend its military presence to the Middle East, Beijing has undeniable regional interests stemming from its Belt and Road Initiative. Chinese majority are in ownership of eastern Mediterranean ports, along with China's military presence in Djibouti indicate that General Secretary Xi sees an opportunity for strategic assertion that further American withdrawal will only increase. By acting in concert with its most committed regional ally, Israel, the United States can rebuild its position in the maritime Middle East. And with that, uh, I will turn the panel over to the next speaker, or the floor over to the next speaker. Um, Professor Limbar? Yeah. I still have this. Uh, thank you, Seth, for this uh, you know, uh, historic overview of the importance of the uh, East Mediterranean. And uh, I would like to start uh, you know, my uh, review of the strategic uh, environment uh, in uh, 91, uh, when uh, uh, actually the Cold War ended, and uh, the East Mediterranean, or the whole Mediterranean, actually became a Mara Nostrum, you know, a lake, uh, American lake. There was no opposition. Uh, the Sixth Fleet was strong, and um, it was uh, the Americans had allies like Turkey, Israel, Egypt, that helped uh, stabilize uh, the region. Uh, and uh, the whole region was actually, uh, as you called it at that time, Pax Americana. <coughs> uh, this uh, has changed changed very much uh, if we look uh, today. Uh, first of all, uh, as we all know, the US reduced its uh, military profile presence in, uh, in, our, in this region. Um, to remind you, in 91, uh, President Assad joined the American forces, not the first line, but the uh, second, third line against uh, Saddam Hussein. And, uh, of course, uh, now uh, uh, Syria is fully allied with uh, Russia and, uh, and Iran. Uh, the reduction of the American profile was the result of policies initiated already by uh, President Obama. Uh, and uh, we've seen uh, recently uh, an American decision by President Trump to reduce uh, withdraw forces from uh, northern Syria. And we all understand that uh, the current administration in Washington has uh, you know, isolationist instincts, and uh, it uh, probably wants to continue this uh, type of policy. Uh, instead of Americans, we have Russians. In Russia, you know, in 91, was busy with internal affairs. Now uh, it has a military presence in Syria. Uh, it's, uh, they do it on the cheap, but it's very effective. Uh, it is viewed as a reliable ally in contrast to the United States. Um, and uh, basically the future of uh, Syria is uh, much in the hands of, uh, of, the, of the Russians. We'll hear more about the Russians from uh, Doug Fais. It's also uh, involved in Egypt. Sukhois, uh, the Egyptians consider buying uh, uh, airplanes so is from uh, from Russia. Uh, the Russians uh, sold uh, uh, two uh, uh, nuclear reactors to the uh, uh, to the Egyptians, which means at least a 50-year uh, dependence upon uh, the goodwill of the Russians to uh, produce energy in Egypt. Uh, I just read today a report that uh, the Russians, the Russian uh, mercenaries, the Wagner, uh, you know, troops are uh, in Libya. Uh, showing that uh, the Russians are not only siding with one part in the, uh, in the civil war, but also are uh, 
probably participating in making sure that uh, their choice is winning in this, uh, in this war. Uh, it is uh, also present in other parts of the Middle East, in the Gulf, even with the Saudi Arabia. So uh, uh, we see a growing Russian presence uh, while the Americans are uh, withdrawing. Another clear uh, trend that uh, we have uh, nowadays in, uh, in, in the East Mediterranean is, uh, of course, a radical Islamic threat. And uh, there was supposed to be a map here, but I'm sure that uh, in contrast to most Americans that don't know very well uh, geography, that you know the area. And uh, uh, if we start with Libya, uh, Libya is in the source of a civil war. There were, uh, for some time, uh, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> Islamist uh, victories there. The ISIS was there. It ended, but still they are uh, active. And uh, we don't know what will happen there. In Egypt, um, it's uh, now a, a military regime, uh, which, uh, for some reasons, it's not always liked in Washington and other parts of the uh, of the Western world, uh, forgetting that uh, you know you have to adapt to the best choices, not to some ideal. Uh, you know, that it's not going to happen. So uh, in Egypt is today, it's fighting uh, Islamic insurgency in Sinai, and uh, Egypt had uh, for over a year uh, Islamist regime. Morsi was in power. And uh, probably uh, today is the strongest political uh, party or particular force in Egypt is the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, the Muslim, if there will be free elections, uh, as in most places, uh, uh, they will probably win. Um, further along the coast, in Gaza, we have actually uh, competing for power two uh, uh, Islamic uh, movements. Uh, Hamas, which is uh, uh, the more moderate one, <laughs> and uh, the Palestinian uh, Islamic Jihad that also vies for power in, in Gaza. Um, and uh, of course, uh, uh, they are uh, clearly <laughs> anti-Western, anti-Israel, and uh, cooperate with Iran. Uh, the Palestinian Islamic Jihad is uh, probably a proxy of Iran, Hamas has a greater you know, amount of autonomy and has his own, its own agenda, but uh, they are cooperating with Iran. Uh, afterwards, it's Israel on the coast. You know, we have uh, some Islamic movements, but uh, they are uh, constrained, uh, and uh, there is a, uh, it's a Jewish state, after all. Uh, further north, it's... Uh, it's a state which is called uh, Lebanon. Uh, it's uh, only in name, uh, Lebanon. Basically, it's a Hezbollah state. Uh, Hezbollah is taking over the, the whole state, and uh, uh, there is no uh, real uh, autonomy for the uh, Lebanese authorities or the Lebanese army or whatever Lebanese uh, is there. The Hezbollah, a proxy of Iran, uh, Islamic. Uh, organization, radical organization, has taken over Lebanon. Uh, in Syria, uh, as a result of the civil war, there are still remnants of uh, radical uh, Islamists that fight uh, the Assad uh, regime. Uh, and um, so far, they are on the losing side after a long uh, period of a civil war, uh, but they are there. And further north, of course, we have Turkey. We'll hear more from Turkey from my colleague, uh, you know, Ayetan Yanagocek. And But Turkey uh, is, uh, as a government uh, and a leader, that is a Turkish version of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, it's quite clearly that the policy of Turkey is uh, guided by uh, Islamist and the Ottoman impulses. So. Uh, you know, if we take a look at the, at the map, we see that a large part of the East Mediterranean coast is actually controlled by Islamist radical uh, movements. Uh, Iran, which is, of course, radical Islam, uh, is, uh, is building uh, a Shiite corridor to Lebanon and to the coast. They want to establish uh, ports in Syria. 
Uh, of course, they used uh, uh, civil war in, uh, in Syria in order to establish a growing presence and influence there. And uh, we may see uh, the uh, Iranian Navy uh, in the eastern uh, Mediterranean. Uh, so um, uh, it's only us, the Israelis, that are fighting their attempt uh, to build this Shiite corridor. And uh, we are very determined to uh, prevent it. Uh, but we see, on the other side, also great determination uh, to continue to hold on to their project uh, to build this Shiite uh, corridor. The uh, US uh, withdrawal leaves uh, several pro-Western states uh, quite exposed. Uh, if we take a look at Cyprus, uh, of course, Cyprus is partly conquered by, uh, by Turkey. It is uh, uh, fearful of additional uh, Turkish uh, aggression. They are feeling it uh, already in the, in the area of energy when the uh, Turkish vessels are bullying uh, you know, exploration efforts on part of, uh, of Cyprus. Uh, they say it's, uh, it's ours. You know, it's, it's like the mafia, you know, you, we want part of it, and if you don't uh, cooperate, uh, there are unpleasant consequences. Greece uh, is a pro-Western, a democratic country, but uh, it's, it's not a strong country. It's weak. It had a lot of uh, economic problems. And uh, of course, it's very fearful of, uh, of Turkey that has renounced you know, the Lausanne Agreement, which uh, designed the borders uh, between Greece and, um, and, and Turkey. Um, we'll see here more for one of my colleagues about the cooperation between Greece, Israel, uh, and Cyprus. And Israel is, of course, is a strong country facing uh, radical Islam, particularly Shi uh, Shiite version of Iran, uh, on several fronts. Uh, and um, uh, this is something that which is uh, of great concern to us. We do not uh, believe uh, that they have benign intentions. Threat perception in Israel of Iranian efforts is very high, uh, I believe with good reason. Uh, the withdrawal of America from, from uh, our region uh, has uh, you know, negative and positive consequences for us. The negative uh, I already mentioned, <coughs> positive uh, ones are that uh, we are gaining importance in Washington. After all, as was mentioned, uh, if you look, if the Americans look around, who is there to protect or help the, protect American interests or help uh, the US, it is Israel that is uh, ready to act. Uh, the others uh, maybe are called allies, but have uh, little capability or uh, willingness to act on behalf of, of the United States. Uh, so we gain greater importance. And of course, we have greater freedom of action. Whenever uh, there is a, a one superpower is living in area, the, the natives have greater uh, freedom of action. Uh, they can do uh, uh, you know, uh, more because they have to take less uh, into consideration uh, the interests of, of the greater power. And I would like uh, maybe to end with uh, an observation that the East Mediterranean has been historically uh, the border between West and East, uh, which uh, you know sometimes you know the Greeks call it the barbarians, and uh, you know the Greeks uh, stopped the Persians uh, in the fifth century BCE. Uh, the Venetians uh, stopped uh, the Ottomans at Lepanto in the sixteenth century. And uh, we may well uh, you know, have to stop uh, this type of aggression from the East uh, again. Uh, unfortunately, I don't see the West uh, resolute uh, to, uh, to take action in, in this fashion. And uh, this, of course, contributes uh, to the Israeli feeling that uh, on many issues, we are really alone. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, being here is a great privilege. I'm honored. Uh, today I would like to speak about Turkish foreign policy on the Eastern Mediterranean. First of all, in order to understand the fundamentals of this foreign policy, uh, I would like to divert your attention to a, uh, to a term that Professor Efraim Imbar already mentioned, Mare Nostrum. When I was a little kid, I was, uh, I was born and raised in Turkey. Of course, as a Jewish Israeli, then this transmission uh, transition was very weird for me uh, that I came to Israel later. But we were told that the Mediterranean was a Turkish lake. Okay, And from this perspective, we should understand that the ordinary Turkish citizen, when they are looking at the Eastern Mediterranean, they feel that this is their lake. And when we are speaking about Cyprus, for instance, uh, we know that uh, the Turkish occupation in Cyprus is since 1974. But uh, in reality, uh, the Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire conquered the island in uh, 1571. So uh, we, do, we should understand the, the dynamics of this Turkish presence in uh, Eastern Mediterranean uh, in a deeper manner. And since 1974, um, we have a new fact on the ground called uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And this uh, republic is, uh, is not basically recognized by the international community, but also not for the Republic of Cyprus. But we should only also not forget that also Turkey is not recognizing this entity. So when we are looking at the Eastern Mediterranean, we are seeing that Turkey is not recognizing the exclusive economic zone maps of Republic of, Cy of Republic of Cyprus, and also Cyprus is not recognizing the exclusive economic zone maps of Turkey and also Tur of Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So we have uh, here a version, uh, the conflict of uh, many versions. Apart from that, uh, in the agency, we have the continental shelf disagreements in the uh, islands of Rhodes and Castellorizo, and the recent Turkish Libyan uh, maritime border just jurisdictional zone accord is also uh, basically um, again diverting our attention to this ground because when we are looking at the map there is an agreement between Republic of Cyprus and Greece from if we are talking about an axis of west to the east and then we have another agreement right now which was done by the Turkish government in the north and in the south uh, the Libyan government. Of course, the Libyan government of national accord is not controlling the shores of Tobruk, you know, the shores of the eastern side of the uh, Libyan territories. According to this uh, agreement, the Tobruk shores and the Turkish shores uh, are considered as the basis of this uh, maritime territorial deal. And on the middle, we have the uh, median line. But uh, of course, uh, given the uh, latest circumstances in uh, Libya, uh, Khalifa Haftar's uh, Libyan National Army may uh, put an end to this uh, agreement since um, Tripoli may even fall uh, in very near future. Since we are talking about Turkish foreign policy, we also should speak about uh, what is Turkey is doing on the ground. And uh, since 2011, Turkey uh, is uh, in a very serious manner uh, brought a new strategy of the military presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. They uh, built uh, their navy. Uh, they, they are making some new reinforcements. Uh, there is a program called MILGEM, which is the acronym of uh, the national warship. Since 2011, they dispatched four, war, uh, four warships, two seismic ships, and two drilling ships. And besides that, in March 2019, Turkey also uh, launched a very impressive uh, military drill uh, in uh, Black Sea, in Agency, and in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, approximately one, 103 uh, vessels uh, took part uh, in this uh, military drill. And there were four important scenarios. One of the, uh, from my perspective, uh, the most important scenario was the occupation of an enemy island. When we are speaking about an enemy island, 
We are not talking about Cyprus because the Turks are already there on the ground and they do not have to carry out an amphibic uh, territorial, uh, extraterritorial um, military action there. So when we are talking about uh, the occupation of an uh, enemy island, we are speaking about Castellorizo, Lesbos, Chios, uh, the, the Greek islands which are very uh, located very closely to the Turkish shores. And uh, approximately two months ago, I, I was uh, the guest of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the State Department of the, of the United States. And there, also my Greek colleagues, uh, they also confirmed that uh, they are very much frightened about this scenario. Uh, besides that, another important uh, scenario, of course, was the uh, targeting of the enemy F-16s. If we are speaking about a member of NATO, Turkey, member of NATO, but describing F-16s as the hostile powers, you know, uh, as, as a hostile power. So regarding the identification friend and foe, so this is a huge question mark. What sort of a NATO member are we talking about? And uh, another important scenario is the downing the enemy UAVs and the un un uh, unmanned air vehicles. Again, when we are looking at the region, we do only see two important producers of the UAVs, apart from Turkey, Israel and Greece. So given this war scenarios, we may understand that the Turks are trying to deter Israel, the Republic of Cyprus, and Greece. In July 2019, according to Tovima newspaper, uh, uh, Turkey brought to Cyprus secretly 42 German-made Leopard tanks. So we are seeing here a very serious brinkmanship policy. And uh, this policy is also very much supported by uh, the statements of the Turkish politicians. For instance, last year, uh, the Turkish politicians, uh, in a loud way, talked about a plan of uh, inaugurating a new military, military basis uh, in Cyprus in order, to pro in order to increase the rapid response ability of the Turkish armed forces. By the way, uh, this military basis would be seven times bigger than the biggest um, Navy base uh, in Turkey, which is located in Marmaris, Aksas. Now I'm going to conclude. Um, when we are looking at the Eastern Mediterranean, Turkey uh, is trying to send a very clear message. If you're going to have a party, you cannot dance without us. They are there with their navy. Now uh, they are also doing um, their best in order to also recruit the international law with this new agreement with uh, Libya. So um, of course, we do see that uh, Turkey is not a reliable partner. And of course, from the Israeli perspective, we cannot rely on Turkey uh, since we unfortunately have some escalations with Gaza Strip and maybe in the future with Lebanon. So we, can, we do not have the luxury to give the ability to Mr. Erdogan to close the taps whenever he wants. You may not tell me, you may tell me that, but Mr. Erdogan is a rational player. He will not do that because he's also going to cause harm to his economy. But then I will tell you this sentence Mr. Erdogan shut down the Russian jet in 2015. And during that particular time period, Russia was providing 55% of the natural gas that Turkey was consuming. 55%, OK? So is it that rational? Maybe it's rational. From my perspective, it's not that rational. So we, we should be you know, very cautious about that. But again, if we would like to build this, uh, this pipeline, Israeli, Cypriot, Greek, and later to Italy, the Turks uh, or should be persuaded, or should be deterred, or should be taken into this uh, venture by giving them some percentages. But this issue should be addressed. And the key issue here is the Cyprus question. From the Turkish perspective, the issue is not money. The Turk, from the Turkish perspective, the real issue is the 
issue of sovereignty. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Doug, you're up. Doug is going to uh, talk about Russia. And uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to participate in this uh, excellent panel and uh, happy to be able to do it from, from the very first one. Uh, I've been I've been asked to talk about Russia's uh, strategic role in the Eastern Mediterranean, and in my remarks, I'm going to on the uh, study that uh, the, that Hudson Institute did as part of a consortium on the Eastern Mediterranean with the University of Haifa uh, Center for Maritime strategy and policy, which is headed by Admiral, Israeli Admiral Shaul Horev, um, the retired Admiral. And it's clear that Russia is taking advantage of the power vacuum that was created by America's desire to disengage from the Middle East. Brian Nimbar uh, referred to this. The President Obama launched the policy of, that he called the pivot away from the Middle East. And President Trump has been carrying that policy forward. The result is that Russia is emerging as the dominant military force in the Middle East. It's being heavily in the uh, Syrian civil war. It was instrumental in saving the Assad regime. It was instrumental also in the Iran nuclear negotiations, sometimes pressuring Iran at the UN, sometimes uh, sometimes pressuring Iran and sometimes defending Iran at, uh, at the UN. Uh, it's, it's not very well known in the United States but significant that Russia was the impresario of a new five-nation treaty among Caspian Sea states that assigned their literal rights. And of course, it negotiated an end to the Syrian civil war. Assad rewarded Putin with access in Syria and control over upgraded military bases. There's the Tardis naval base, uh, and the Khmeimim Air Base, which has now expanded and improved with new radar, drone, and other technology. And from those bases, Russia is in a position to project power not only into the Middle East and the Balkans, but farther west along the Mediterranean. It's actually positioned to execute an area denial strategy. Uh, in any future conflict with the United States. Now, in Syria, Russia decisively affected the outcome of the civil war. I mean, Assad won the civil war to a large extent because of help that he got from Russia and Iran. And what the Russians did in Syria was tested and demonstrated their weaponry. Uh, the, they first used manned aircraft to hit targets in September 2015. Russia's attacks in Syria included their first combat use of various Russian precision-guided munitions. It, uh, it was a testing ground also for Russian electronic warfare. Russia hit rebel targets with manned aircraft flying not only out of its base in Syria, but also from an air base in Iran. It struck with cruise missiles fired from naval vessels in the Caspian and Mediterranean seas. It used surface ships. It used submarines. It also used private contractor military forces, which journalists referred to as either paid mercenaries 
or sometimes little green men. It's it's uh, an important new technique that the Russians have been developing and they use uh, to great effect in Ukraine. Russia went out of its way to demonstrate a wide range of military capabilities. It aimed not only to be effective against Assad's enemies, the rebel forces in Syria, it is also to make a big impression throughout the region, and it did so. Russia has made basing arrangements that will allow it to stage and to repair and to operate autonomous underwater systems. It already has the ability to interdict under, undersea communication cables. Its submarines that are based in Syria can threaten undersea infrastructure in addition to firing land attack cruise missiles. It's worth noting that the Ru Russian state-owned television uh, said that a Russian oceanographic research ship can not only connect undersea cables, but cut and jam underwater sensors. Oh. Let's talk for a second about Russia's interests in the Middle East. It intervened in Syria to help its longtime ally, the Assad regime, and to gain leverage against the United States. Among Russia's main regional interests is increasing world energy prices. The Russian economy is largely the sale of oil and gas. It's hard to overstate how much Russia and Putin depend on high energy prices. Nearly half of Russia's GDP for years has been energy sales. I, I have to say that I'm surprised how often there are articles about Russia's strategic involvement in the Middle East that don't mention its overriding national interest in high energy prices. You cannot understand what the Russians are doing in the Middle East without focusing on their enormous interest in high energy prices. Russia wants the power to influence energy-related decisions of the Saudis and others in the region. And an important point, especially for U.S. policymakers, is that it's wrong to assume that Russia shares America's interest in Middle East stability. On the contrary, instability tends to put upward pressure on energy prices, and that tends to be uh, the, a, a decisive interest for in, in, under almost all circumstances. Russia also has a large interest in arms sales. I don't want to suggest that everything that Russia does is explained by their business interests relating to oil and gas prices and arms sales, but because they, they do obviously also have geopolitical interests in the region, but I want to emphasize the, the energy and the arms sales interests and business-related interests because they usually don't get as much attention as they should. Now, what are the results of Russia's military victory in Syria? Uh, first of all, I want to emphasize that they scored that victory in alliance with Iran and with the Assad regime. They have, as a result, increased Russia's influence in Syria, which gives Russia influence with Iran and also with the countries that worry about Iran. For example, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf states, Egypt, Jordan, Turkey, and Israel. So, most of the countries in the Middle East believe that the great divide, the great uh, uh, fault line in international affairs is the fault line between an aggressive Iran and the, and the Sunni Arab states. And the Russians now have an ability to play both sides of that fault line because of their position in Syria. Now, Israel is working, as Professor Inbar mentioned, is working to keep Iran from establishing bases and capabilities in Syria for against Israel. 
the, the Iranians have been able to threaten Israel across the Lebanese-Israeli border through their proxy relationship with Hezbollah. What they have been looking to recently is to extend the line across which Israel into Syria. And they want to create facilities for Iran to be able to directly threaten Israel by use not of its Hezbollah proxy, but by use of Iranian forces in Syria. The Israelis don't want to allow that. And the Israelis have been bombing time and time again Iranian facilities and forces in Syria to prevent the Syrians from being able to threaten Israel directly across the Syrian-Israeli border. I should say boundary, it's not really a border. Uh, now, Israel has to coordinate with Russia on these strikes against the Iranians in Syria in order to minimize the danger that Israel will hit Russian personnel or assets in Syria. Russia is not tying Iran's hand. Syria neither is it stopping Israel from striking the Iranians. There was a, an incident in September 2018 in which a, a Russian IL-20 plane was found in connection with an Israeli attack in Syria. Now, that damaged Russian-Israeli relations, but officials of the two countries have worked to repair the damage and to prevent incidents like that from happening again, and they, they created deconfliction mechanisms. Russia has delivered S-300 air defense missile batteries to Syria. Uh, it's assumed that the Russian personnel are manning those batteries while they train the Syrians. Israel is worried about the possible upgrade by Russia uh, of those missile batteries to the S-400 air defense system, which has a longer range and would be a much more serious threat to Israeli air action. Now, all of this has affected U.S.-Israeli relations, because some U.S. officials have expressed unhappiness that Israel is coordinating and working with the Russians as it is. But, US, but Israeli officials respond that they're in a bind. And they have to coordinate with Russia, given the importance of keeping the Iranians from building bases in Syria, and that the Israelis make the correct point that the United States actually has an interest in preventing the Iranians from having that capability also. This is an example of the Israelis being able to take military action that actually serves common Israeli-American interests under circumstances where the United States would not want to take that military action itself. And the Israelis point out that they're in this bind in, with regard to Iran and Syria in large part because the United States created the military vacuum that Russia is filling. When President Trump recently announced that he wanted to quit Syria, that further reinforced Russia's role as power broker in the country, and President Trump made clear that Russia's role in Syria was okay with him. Now, as for Iran, the Trump administration has been very tough on Iran in its imposition of U.S. sanctions, which have been highly effective, even though they're unilateral. And I think the Trump administration deserves credit for, for making powerful use of unilateral American sanctions, much more powerful and much more effective than uh, almost anybody, I believe, thought was possible for, you, for unilateral sanctions uh, before President Trump came into office. So he's been very tough on Iran through the use of those sanctions. But he hasn't said, uh, President Trump has not said that he's committed to keeping the Iranians from establishing their capabilities in Syria. Israel is on its own in fighting Syria, uh, Iran in Syria, and that requires a degree of Israeli coordination with Russia. Now, the situation is a challenge for the Israelis because they need to preserve their most important relationship, their alliance with the United States. And of course, the United States has an enormous interest in, in that relationship. Also, we benefit from it substantially. But the Israelis also need to work with Russia regarding the Iranian presence in Syria. 
And I'll end by simply noting again that the strategic realities that I've called attention to in, in my remarks are largely the result of an American decision made by President Obama and continued by President Trump that we are looking to withdraw and essentially pivot away from turn our backs on the Middle East. This kind of effort to try to isolate the United States from the Middle East, at one level, you could say is understandable. Americans are, were very unhappy with the, uh, with the Bush administration, Iraq war. They're very unhappy with dealing with a region that's full of, of violent and religiously extreme and corrupt and anti-American regimes and uh, the desire to isolate yourself from that is perfectly understandable, but I would argue it's not realistic. It can't be achieved. The United States can run away from the Middle East if it wants to, but the problems of the region will chase after it. And, it'll, and those problems will chase after us in the form of terrorism, of oil supply issues, of cyber attacks, of uh, regional instability. It, it, there is, there's no escaping the problems of the Middle East. There's a, a, isolationism, as understandable as the impulse is, is not realistic. It's not uh, something that we can achieve. All we can do if we try to run away from the Middle East is reduce our influence there and increase the influence of countries like Russia. But we can't actually succeed in, in, in protecting the United States from the, the various problems of the Middle East. And uh, so with that, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, all. Um, we have time for some questions uh, before a short break and moving to the next um, panel. Uh, so uh, the floor is open. Hello? Oh, uh, one thing. Um, would you, when recognized, please identify, tell us your name and what association you have, you know, where you work? What you, who you're with, um, and please ask the question in the form of a question. Thanks. Uh, I'm Noah Fratkin of, of the Hudson Institute, and wanted to thank uh, my colleagues and all the participants for this this conference. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Professor uh, Yana Rochak. I've got that right. Um, his opinion about uh, the Turkish initiative uh, that he spoke of, uh, and in particular, what he think, how far he thinks Erdogan is willing to go to accomplish what he wants, and also, what is it that he wants to, to accomplish? You mentioned, he, you put it, the, I think this way, he wants to let everyone know that if there's going to be a party, he gets to 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 celebrate. Uh, what is it he? Uh, wants uh, and how far is he willing to go and what risks is he willing to take to achieve? Shall we? Okay. Um, um, I must admit that uh, the Turkish president uh, is very much enjoying this kind of um, international tensions with non-Muslim countries. For instance, whenever there is a tension with Israel, Russia, China, United States, Holland, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, of course, Greece, Armenia, Cyprus. Uh, so uh, this basically is playing to his hands because the, uh, the economic situation in his country is not doing very well. And wh whenever there is a friction with a non-Muslim country, so he's basically attracting the um, the support of the masses and people, instead of speaking about how much money do they make uh, during a during a month, they they are 
you know, uh, talking about Greece, Israel, Russia, or United States. Uh, so, uh, so also f uh, for his own popularity at home, it's very much important because he turned uh, this whole issue. I mean, the Turkish foreign policy became his PR, uh, PR at home. So uh, he tends to use this Turkish foreign policy for his own survival. And when we are talking about his survival, so he can go to the end. He can go to the end uh, because he knows very well that if he's going to be toppled, he's not going to go to fishing uh, like his predecessors did uh, in uh, Western Turkey. But uh, most likely, most likely, his opponents will try to imprison him, and uh, that's why he he's um, just going with this brinkmanship policy. Um, uh, in a very uh, serious manner, he is also taking steps. He is sending uh, he is sending the, uh, the Turkish military uh, not only to Eastern Mediterranean. You can also look at the uh, northern Syria. We did not speak about northern Syria, but I think uh, we cannot exclude northern Syria and uh, the Turkish uh, efforts of making northern Syria into a Turkish protectorate. Uh, this is the uh, we cannot ignore this. Right, so um, how far he can he can take it? I can I think he can he can go he can go further, uh, but he, he he should be deterred. He should be deterred by someone. Maybe Donald Trump may deter him. Maybe Donald Trump uh, should lock himself again in the restroom and should tweet some. You know, you know, he should tweet, and he should shake the Turkish economy again and again. Maybe this is the language uh, that uh, Mr. Erdogan. Uh, understands, uh, as far as I understand. And your second question, what he wants. He wants to survive and he, he wants to build a legacy. And uh, it's not a secret that Mr. Erdogan is, um, is, a, is a huge admirer of Abdul Hamid II. Uh, from his perspective, Ab Abdul Hamid II uh, was, you know, tend to, you know, he wanted to be the savior of the uh, savior of the uh, Ottoman Empire, but uh, the Jews and the Freemasons did not let him. So this now this is the revenge time. Okay, so this time again, uh, just like Abdul Hamid II uh, played a dual uh, foreign policy between Great Britain and Germany. Then today, Mr. Erdogan is uh, adopting a dual foreign policy vis-à-vis -vis United States and Russia in order to maximize. The Turkish, uh, the Turkish interests, and when we are looking at the Eastern Mediterranean, whenever there is a friction with the Greek, it's very sexy. Okay, so this is always in his, this is always playing into into his hands in terms of Turkish domestic policy. Yes, I, um, I understand that uh, the main uh, impetus is uh, <coughs> domestic. But uh, I don't think that we should uh, underestimate the neo-Ottoman impulses of, uh, of Erdogan and of the Turks. It's not only the AKP that has this uh, neo-Ottoman dreams. We have other parties you know, that have this uh, type of uh, uh, international appetite. And we see uh, Turkish troops in, uh, in Qatar, in the Horn of Africa, in Sudan. Uh, this is more than just political survival. So uh, he has, uh, of course, claims to lead the Muslim world uh, when uh, the Muslim part of the Muslim world is in trouble. He is uh, a clear opponent of Egypt, of Saudi Arabia. So uh, I think he plays a much larger game than just uh, domestic politics. Other questions? This might be most appropriate for the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense, was faith, but it goes back to Turkey. Nick Larigak is president of the American Hellenic Institute, so you can understand where I'm going to go with my question. Turkey, obviously, is a NATO country in a very dangerous area of the world. We mentioned all the bad players all around it, and it's for that reason why we needed a, a partner in Turkey to be able to mitigate these circumstances in the context of the region. But we've seen the proliferation of Turkish provocativeness 
over the course, well, the la I will argue over the last at least 40 years, but let's just keep it, you know, for the last cu couple of months. S 400s, Pastor Brunson, uh, Russia with Russia, uh, the illegal agreement between uh, Libya and them, not understanding there's a little island in front here called Crete, and islands do have economic zones and do have continental shelves if you you know, if you agree with what the Enclaus Treaty has to say, although Turkey has either ratified or signed on to it. At the end of the day, Turkey makes moves, from my opinion, based on trying to get reactions. And in the case of what he did recently, including northern, northern Syria and, and also in the, in the eastern, uh, in, in between uh, Libya and Turkey, I call it appeasement by our president by virtue of you know, hey, one day I'm going to destroy your economy. The next day, you're the best president, the best leader. Mm -hmm. All this basically creates an, an environment for him to go out and to do these provocative actions. So, Doug Fife, what should be our policy? This, this conference is U.S. influence. Does the United States, does President Trump, that he claims to have such a great relationship with President Erdogan, in which I consider to be the number one destabilizing country in the region for all interests, including Greece, Israel, and Cyprus, which, by the way, is plus the United States in that relationship, and has created a land bridge to Israel with, from Syria. What should be the response of the United States to a strong man like Mr. Erdogan, who has proven time and time again is not a faithful, reliable NATO partner in the definition of that word? I think that uh, I think that much of what you say is is right and deeply troubling, and it's the reason that there are more and more voices in Washington, in the in the government, and on Capitol Hill and elsewhere, uh, questioning whether it makes sense for uh, Turkey to remain a NATO ally. I mean, there's an argument that. That uh, with the Erdogan policy, Turkey, and in particular, I mean, the most uh, uh, visible problem policy being the purchase by Turkey of uh, the Russian air defense system, the S-400, uh, which caused the United States to throw Turkey out of the F-35 program. Um, there's an argument that that Turkey does not any longer have the kind of alignment with the United States and the other NATO countries to remain a, uh, an ally. The, the argument that, that various other people have made, even people who are deeply disturbed by Erdogan's policies, is that Turkey was around before Erdogan, Turkey will be around after Erdogan, and while the United States should be taking measures to limit the damage that Turkey can do to the alliance, the, the, the argument is that we shouldn't be trying to expel Turkey from the alliance. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that there's no mechanism for expelling an ally from NATO. And so that's an issue. But, uh, but even, even if one were in, inclined to do it, there's an argument that it, it, it might be better to wait uh, until we see what happens after Erdogan. Um, and in the meantime, take measures such as the expulsion of, of the Turks from the F-35 program to try to limit the damage that Erdogan can do to the alliance. I consider it an extremely hard problem. I have not personally thought it through to the, to, to the extent that I would say that I know what I would do if, if I were in a position of responsibility right now. I know that I'd be looking at the issue of whether they can remain an ally, uh, but I also take very seriously the argument that it, 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 Turkey remains an, a, an important country, and if we ever can get a, a, a government in Turkey that uh, will return to the pro-alliance policies of the predecessor regimes to uh, predecessor governments to, to that of Erdogan, um, that it's worth keeping Turkey in the alliance. I consider it a very hard problem, but I also think that we really do need to take serious measures 
against uh, against the damage that Erdogan is doing to the alliance. Uh, we're going to take a break now. Um, there, uh, no, one more, if, if we can make a short question or a short answer, we'll... Uh, Ken Meyercourt, unaffiliated. Uh, Professor Inbar, you mentioned that Israel has always been ready to come to the aid of the United States as it pursues its policies in the Middle East. When has Israel ever come to the aid of the United States? Well, uh, one's the best. First of all, I didn't say always. We have our own toys. But uh, uh, we obviously, in 1970, when uh, the Jordanian regime uh, was uh, in trouble and the Syrian invaded uh, Jordan, uh, the Americans didn't have the force to react to a proxy of uh, Moscow. And it was uh, us who deterred the Syrians from uh, continuing their offensive against uh, King Hussein at that time. Uh, we've done uh, a lot of other things. You know, we've done uh, dirty work for Americans in many areas of the world. And uh, I think this has been always appreciated in Washington. Of course, what do you want us? We are not altruistic. You know, where, where do you find altruism in international relations? Come on, don't be naive. Of course, we do. Uh, and this is the beauty of the relationship, because the Americans and the Israelis have many common interests by the mere fact what they are. You want us to fight in Afghanistan? I'm not sure you want to fight in Afghanistan. So uh, why should we do? <laughs> yeah, you, you have your own sensitivities, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Arab world. You, you really don't want us to be, you know, a full partner. Uh, we are never offered to be part of NATO. So, you know, even uh, the American desires have their own constraints. And I think we try, uh, we've been a faithful, uh, good ally of, for the United States for many, many years. And you'll not find a better one in the whole Middle East. Okay, let, let, me just, let me just say that the, uh, the definition of a, of a useful ally is not a country that you will call upon to act against its interests to do things that you want them to do. It's a country whose interests align with yours so that when you ask them to do something that's useful to you, you have a reasonably good chance that they'll, that they'll do it because their interests align. Another way we don't being... want the Americans to fight for us. And I uh, don't think uh, it's reasonable uh, that the Americans should demand of us you know, to fight for their wars. We fight our own wars. You fight your own wars. There are other areas in which there are, there's commonality, and we can do, act together. C'est la vie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're very close to agreement here, so uh, let's take a break for, uh, for 10 minutes, and then we'll have the second panel. Mm -hmm. and thank, thank you, the first panel, for your participation. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you didn't have to say, but if you're interested, what do you say? <laughs> okay, you <laughs> are we, I saw you put something up. Are, yeah, well, I think that we Bill, should. are we still mic And in hope. Thank you, Doug. About on the, on this, all on, on, Thank you. The, you talked about the Middle East being yeah. the barrier against yes. the, the East. Uh, the, I don't abandon hope is that, as you know, it took the, the West a long time to get to Lepanto. I mean, all yes, sorts of bad things happened before they finally...
the Venetians got pissed off enough to say, okay, we have to do something. Right. So, so, uh, from you. I hope so. I hope so. By the way, Shaul was my PhD student. Did you know? Uh, no, I didn't. <laughs>
Uh, let's uh, let's begin the presentation so we have a little bit more time for questions um, for af afterwards. Uh, Dr. Aaron Lehrman is a colonel in the reserves and will discuss the East Mediterranean's emerging security architecture. He researches and writes um, at JISS, where he's also vice president. Dr. Lehrman holds a PhD from the London School of Economics and was a deputy director for foreign policy and international affairs. He served at the National Security Council in the Israeli Prime Minister's office between 2009 and 15, and also as a paratrooper in the IDF. He will be followed by Amir Foster, um, Executive Director uh, of the Association of Oil and Gas Exploration Industries in Israel. He, uh, Amir uh, established the Foster Consultancy Group that focuses on the energy sector in general, natural gas in, in particular. Mr. Foster will look at energy options in the East Mediterranean. He, in turn, will be followed by Major General of the Reserves, Eitan Dangot, uh, who has served in the IDF for 37 years. During his military career, he served as military secretary in Israel's Ministry of Defense uh, in 2004 and 2009, and later was appointed as a coordinator of government activities in Judea, Samaria, and the Gaza Strip. After retirement from the military, he was president of the American uh, the Association of Oil and Gas Exploration Industries in Israel and chairman of a government company uh, limited. Advanced Propulsion Systems. Um, uh, General Dangot will discuss the problem of defending energy deposits in the Middle East. The last speaker um, is Eric Edelman, who will examine the US military and diplomatic presence in the region. Ambassador Edelman represented the US in Finland in the Clinton administration and in Turkey in the Bush administration. He later served uh, as an important advisor to Vice President Cheney for national security affairs. He retired from the Foreign Service in 2009 and now serves as chair of the National Defense Strategy Commission. Ambassador Edelman holds a PhD in US diplomatic history from Yale. I'd like to thank you once again for joining us this afternoon. Um, and uh, I will... Uh, Leave right. the floor to Iran here. Um, given the range of threats, given the range of, uh, of uh, threats that we've been hearing about in the previous session, at least I'm in a position to be the bearer of better news. Um, but then, uh, from my occasional testing of whether people, either this side or our side of the water, have uh, the slightest idea what the EMGF stands for, um, I would say that this is my ultimate proof that good news travel nowhere. Uh, bad news, front page, the emergence of an Eastern Mediterranean gas forum bringing together Italy, Greece, Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, and the Palestinian Authority for already um, two meetings in this year, January and then again July. July also attended, both of them in Cairo. July, the July meeting attended by Secretary of Energy, U.S. Secretary of Energy, Rick Perry. Um, an organization, by the way, um, sponsored and supported also by the European Union from Brussels. So all of these significant good news in an era of very poor news, the fact that this is almost, has gone almost unnoticed is in itself a noticeable observation about the state of, uh, our state of affairs. But there's a reason why I consider the EMGF, or not necessarily the institutional structure, but what it stands for and what its existence implies to be um, emblematic of the opportunities that may be opening up for putting together an alternative, a new 
regional security architecture. In fact, I would take it as far as to say that's an opportunity for Israel to reconsider which region do we actually live in. Because I would, I would argue that the term Middle East has outrun its utility. Uh, it is very much a British colonial term, although um, I, I think the first to use it was actually Admiral Mahan, but it did it in London. And it very much speaks to a, uh, a world order measured in distances from northeastern Euro northwestern Europe, which, to the best of my understanding, is no longer the center of the universe. Go tell the Chinese, whose very name means the center of the universe, that um, they are far from anything. So there's no Far East, and there should be no Middle East or Near East by the same logic. Moreover, I've also all too often come across maps and pieces of analysis that look at the Middle East but totally ignore Cyprus, even as a physical presence, not to mention Greece and other players in the neighborhood. But this is no longer a viable position. And um, energy as you will hear um, from my colleagues, is part of the story. But I would actually put it on a, 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 as part of a list, which conveniently, actually, is a list of eight E reasons, all beginning with an E, for the emergence of this uh, block. I would not yet, not yet use the term alliance, but it's a, certainly an alignment of forces uh, with the Greek Cypriot Israeli and Greek Cypriot Egyptian triangles at its core, the EMGF as a broader institutional structure that may well extend beyond gas and energy interests down the road, and the whole set of commonalities that bring us together under the, this modern term of LM, like-minded nations in our region. So very quickly, there's first and foremost, I believe, from an Israeli perspective, but not only from an Israeli perspective, certainly from an American perspective, given the immense investment in Egyptian stability since the Egyptians crossed the lines as a consequence of Kissinger's diplomacy in the 1970s and became a cornerstone of strategy, American strategy in the region. Um, Egypt is first and foremost in this set of considerations. For us, of course, as Israelis, the idea of a country of 100 million going belly up or descending into chaos on our border is almost too frightening to contemplate. The fact that we live without an Egyptian cloud over our heads is due to the efforts of the present Egyptian regime. That uh, Israel is now worried about Iran, and we have a Palestinian issue to grapple with. We don't have to worry as we spent our first generation in Israel worrying about Egypt. We want it to stay that way. <clears throat> and therefore, we need to see as much as possible a commonality of interest with Egypt and with others in the region who have the same perspective. This is originally what brought us in Greece and Cyprus together. Um, the second E we have heard already quite a bit about, namely Erdogan and his ambitions, not Turkey necessarily as a nation. Turkey. Uh, if you read the uh, text of the trilat the summers, uh, summing up the trilateral, the already six trilateral summits of Israel, Greek, and Cypriot leaders, and similarly Egyptian, Greek, and Cypriot leaders, also six so far, uh, you would be struck by a, a paragraph right up front which says, this is not an exclusive club. We are open to all like-minded Essentially, it says we are, we are open to all like-minded nations, which is our way of saying 
once Turkey returns to the fold, once it is led by people who see a like-minded interest in the Eastern Mediterranean, this is certainly a place for Turkey to belong to, but not under the present neo-Ottoman disposition. Energy I will not expand, the third E, I will not expand upon because you'll hear more about it. My fourth E would be exercises. I don't know to what an extent you've noticed, but Israel has just upgraded not only the level of, of, of involvement, but also the level of exposure of our, com of our exercises in Cyprus. Uh, General, Lieutenant General uh, Aviv Kochavi, the IDF Chief of Staff, has actually been now in Cyprus uh, uh, to, co uh, to coincide and to monitor the training of our commando units, of our uh, special forces on Cypriot soil in scenarios which are now openly declared, as everyone knew anyway, because that's the logic of it, uh, to be related to Lebanese scenarios, Lebanese land, uh, pre uh, simulating Lebanese landscapes in the high Troodos mountain. And he met with his uh, uh, Cypriot uh, <coughs> counterpart. The Cypriots are actually <coughs> participating in these exercises. This is the fourth time, I believe, that our special forces have gone there to train, but this, now, this has now been given much greater salience. I would add uh, to this list these, uh, the naval exercises, tripartite, American, Greek, Israeli, uh, noble diner, uh, Israeli participation, participation in uh, the Inyohos uh, air exercises in Greece, Greek participation in the biannual blue flag exercises in the Negev, and so on and so forth, we are looking at actually uh, increasingly a military to military dimension of this emerging relationship. Um, I could go down the list. The environment, the fragile Eastern Mediterranean, made more fragile 50, more than 50 years ago by the creation of the high dam which has completely destroyed the beneficial impact of the uh, Nile on the Eastern Mediterranean, and, and so we are seeing all sorts of consequences that we need to face. Um, the economy, with Israel being a powerhouse that the Greeks and Cypriots are glad to latch onto, particularly when it comes to high tech. It's not for nothing. The fifth of the six um, tripartite summits was actually held in Beersheva as a way of <coughs> advertising our claim that this is becoming or would become or is already the cyber capital of the world, quote unquote. Our other capital, in other words, is not beside Jerusalem, our eternal capital is not Tel Aviv, which may be the Mediterranean capital of cool, it's uh, Beersheva, uh, the cyber capital, the would-be cyber capital of the world. And this was a way of, 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 of using the opportunity uh, to make a point. Um, emergencies. We've seen the Greeks and Cypriots come to our help in the catastrophic forest fires in uh, December 10 and more recently in May uh, 19. And uh, we've done the same here and there. We have uh, protocols for mutual assistance, the Italians <coughs> also, the Croatians up the Adriatic, the Eastern Mediterranean Emergency Cooperation is also an important element. And let's bear in mind that in a man-made emergency, we are under a rocket barrage, and our airports and seaports become too dangerous, quote unquote, for uh, the international uh, um, shipping companies and, and airlines to go to. It will be Zim and El Al who would need um, an immediate backup, and Cyprus in this respect is part of our strategic debt. And finally, I would mention um, Europe. Europe being um, Brussels the, and its institutions, its structural um, <coughs> elements, which reacted quite, uh, as, as you've heard, quite um, foolishly, I would say, to the overthrow of Morsi in, in Egypt, failing to realize just how dangerous Muslim Brotherhood rule would have been not only for Egypt, but for the region 
in its entirety. So uh, for us, as well as Cyprus and Greece, to be able to bring a different voice to the European debate, and also for us to have Greece and Cyprus uh, watching out for some of our interests in the internal European dynamics, and most European decisions need to be taken by consensus, uh, makes uh, the European arena and its uh, consider considerations flowing from the European dynamics our eighth <coughs> E on the list. And the result has been a, a very remarkable transformation of Israel's regional standard. Uh, as you will hear, a growing integration with uh, Jordan and Egypt uh, uh, on energy and other matters. And despite various problems and tensions in our own politics, Greek politics, Italian politics, um, this has gone forward. And I believe that this is a venture that the United States should continue to support. I, I used to say, um, uh, Seth, that uh, the United, it's time for Washington to think of the Mediterranean not only as an SLOC. The, and, and take this to be a strategic environment by its own right. Uh, encourage the emergence of Mediterranean institutions. So in this respect, the participation of Secretary of State Pompeo in the, the sixth tripartite meeting of Netanyahu and Assasiades, and it was still Tsipras then in Greece, and the participation of Secretary Perry in the second round of the EMGF consultations in France is a very hopeful indication looking towards the future. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, um, distinguished, distinguished guests, um, I'm happy to, to be here and to have a few words and a short uh, presentation uh, about uh, the Israeli uh, natural gas uh, industry and uh, regional uh, industry. Okay, so the other one, please. Thank you. So the Association of the Oil and Gas Exploration Industries in Israel was uh, established in 2010 and comprises virtually all the companies active in the market in Israel, both foreign and Israeli. Uh, one of our uh, members is uh, Nobel Energy, the American company. Uh, the association repre represents the voice of the industry in Israel and uh, part of the Manufacturers Association. Before we dive into Israel and the East Med, let us begin with forecast of the future global energy mix according to IEA publications. The long-term projections of the IEA include three scenarios. The current policies scenario, which is based solely on government energy policies of countries around the world. This is the most conservative scenario with regard to the continued global use of fossil fuels. New policy scenario, which is based on current policies as well as estimates regarding technological development in future years this forecast also includes the commitments made by different countries under the Paris Agreement. However, this forecast does not include <coughs> speculations about future policy changes. This is the base scenario of the IEA outlook. Sustainable development scenario, this forecast does include speculations regarding future policy changes. According to the IEA base scenario, the use of fossil fuels in 2040 will be 74% of total primary energy supply. Non-fossil fuels such as PV, wind, and hydro 
as well as nuclear, will account for 26%. It should be noted that even under the sustainable development scenario, fossil fuel will still represent the lion's share of energy demand, 60%. I will proceed with the base scenario. Until today, coal and oil were the primary sources of energy growth. Between 2000 and 2017, oil and coal accounted for 54% of global energy growth. Gas accounted for 26% and non-fossil fuels for 80% only. According to the IEA forecast, the picture will change dramatically as the share of coal and oil in energy growth will decrease to 14% only and natural gas will become the main driver of energy transition. The mix of non-fossil fuels will account for 55% of energy growth. The story of the Israeli gas industry begins at the end of the previous millennium when a gas field with commercial quantities was, was discovered in the south part of Israel's economic waters. The, the gas field actually uh, founded uh, by American company Nobel Energy, like actually all the other fields that found in Israel later. The first production of natural gas from this field began in 2004, but the game changer took place at the end of the previous decade when a very large gas reserve, the Tamar gas field, which contained more than 300 BCM of natural gas, was discovered in Israel's economics water. Again, discovered by Nobel Energy. And the ultra deep water, the, the ultra deep water offshore Tamar Reserve led to a breakthrough in the Eastern Mediterranean region with the discovery of a large number of natural gas reserves added by the giant Leviathan Reserve in 2010, which, which contains more than 600 BCM of natural gas. In a short period of time, about 1,000 BCM of natural gas was discovered offshore Israel. This quantity was enough to supply 200 years of domestic consumption of natural gas. I should emphasize that since its establishment, Israel was completely dependent on the supply of energy from foreign sources even though in 2004 Israel began using its own natural gas, this was a limited source of energy. The discovery of large gas reserve came as a huge surprise for Israel, and this was challenged in terms of regulation, and this led to re regulatory changes in this area. In 2013, less than four years after its discovery, production began from the Tamar Reserve, and the consumption of natural gas by the Israeli industry shifted into high gear. In 2017, historic gas export agreement was signed between Israel and Jordan. In 2017 also, the Leviathan partners made a final investment decision which, give, which gave a green light to the largest energy project in the history of Israel. In 2018, another historic agreement was signed between the Leviathan Partnership, the Tamar Partnership, and Egyptian private company, Dolphinos. A few months later, Greek company Energian made an FID to develop the Karish Antonin Reservoirs. Moving on to the latest development in the Israeli natural gas sector, production of natural gas from the Leviathan Reserve is scheduled to begin sometime in the next few days. This is one of the biggest natural gas projects in the world today, and the largest private utility project in the history of Israel. As you can imagine, this is a very exciting development for Israel, and I should add, for the region. The Karish and Tanin gas reserve are at advanced development stages, and the production of gas from these fields is planned to start in the first quarter of 2021. 
it was recently decided to, to discontinue the use of coal in Israel and replace it with natural gas. Gas exports to Jordan and Egypt are expected to start soon, and the Egyptian gas hub is underway. As you can see in the graph, a decade and a half after Israel began using natural gas, domestic consumption reached, reached 11 BCM. Natural, natural gas currently accounts for nearly 40% of primary energy consumption in Israel. Natural gas is mainly used for power generation, while over the years it has become increasingly dominant in the production of electricity. How dominant? In 2018, natural gas accounted for 66% of the energy mix used in production of electricity in Israel. And I said, by 2025, the use of coal will be discontinued and the share of natural gas will be as high as 85%. In other words, as of 2025, power generation will use domestic energy resources only, which not, which, which, not lo which not long ago was almost impossible to imagine. Today, natural gas represents almost 40% of Israel's energy mix. The data in the graph date back to 2016 and has been rising steadily since then. I think the numbers are quite overwhelming because in a short period of time, the share of natural gas in Israel's energy mix is high its share in countries with developed gas markets such as Canada, US, UK, Italy, and the Netherlands. In my opinion, following the decision regarding the transition from coal to gas, in the next 10 years, natural gas will represent almost 60% of total primary energy consumption in Israel. Despite the massive penetration of natural gas into the Israeli market, and although <coughs> I believe that during the next 10 years, natural gas will reach 60% of the primary energy mix, Israel is a small market in relation to its enormous gas reserves. And there is still a huge potential for additional gas discoveries in its economic waters. Therefore, the future development of the Israeli gas industry is large, largely dependent on the massive export of natural gas. The gas export agreement with Jordan are highly important. But even more significant is the export agreement signed with Egypt. The demand for natural gas in Egypt is the highest in the region, and despite that the important discovery of the huge Zor field, Egypt still needs additional resources in order to secure the continued supply of natural gas for its huge market. In addition, Egypt has two liquefaction plants that are almost inactive, which also require an in, in, in interpreted supply of gas. Another export option, which is currently being reviewed, is the East Med pipeline. I can honestly say, when I first heard about it, this option seems less probable. But the more I studied the issue, the more I become convinced that it is viable from an economic and engineering point of view. However, this project is still at early stages. Finally, a few words on the Egyptian natural gas market. Egypt gas demand continues to grow. From 64 BCM in 2018, rising to 70 BCM by 2020, and 80 BCM by 2030. The reason for the decline in consumption of natural gas in the first part of the decade was the shortage of natural gas supply. <laughs> New large-scale CCGT plants, the biggest power plants of the kind in the world, will support gas demand, as well as support electricity demand in Egypt. 
Industrial gas demand returned to 2012 levels in 2017, but there is latent demand from existing plant which still use oil distillates. In the short term, domestic production will increase, but in the longer term, it is expected to decline. The Egyptian energy sector underwent a dramatic upheaval in the past decades as a result of many years of stagnation in development the Egyptian gas industry due to the poor commercial condition that prevailed for too long. And in view of the absence of internal stability caused by protest in the country. In recent years, Egyptian president El Sisi has led a real revolution and improved commercial conditions in the Egyptian gas sector. El Sisi actions, together with the stabilization of the regime in Egypt, have led to renewed exploration and development of gas fields in the country, reaching a high point with the discovery of the huge Zor field. At the same time, despite the discovery of gas in Egypt, since El Sisi came to power, production from Egypt's old gas field continue, continues to decrease, and the country, with the almost 100 million residents, continues to need a regular, cheap, and clean supply of energy. The red line is the projected demand for gas in Egypt, which the gap can be supplied with gas imports from Israel and new gas discoveries in Egypt and in the region. Another source of demand for gas in Egypt, which, which does not appear in the graph, are, are the two liquefaction plant, plants, which may consume up to almost 20 BCM per year. Apart from the quantities of gas avail available for export that have already been discovered of Israel's shores, there is the potential for additional fines of around 2,100 BCM of the Israeli coastline alone. In addition, there is considerable potential for natural gas to be found in the economic waters of other countries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Major General Eitan Dangot, the president of the association, is going to elaborate on the strategic and geopolitical implication of this new energy reality in the region. Thank you. Good afternoon. After me will be only one, so it's ended. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity to come here and to share with you, with you some of our thinking about the opportunities that uh, <laughs> the discoveries of the gas field around us and change the position of Israel from being a country without any resources, with resources, give us, I think, a lot of uh, opportunities for the coming future even that the threats around us are increased as it was discovered, uh, as it was uh, mentioned between, uh, especially uh, the threat that coming from the Northeast, I mean by the Iranian uh, activities from Iran to Iraq to Syria to Lebanon with Hezbollah together. So what I would like to emphasize here is the fact that Israel position is a very strong military country which give us a lot of a uh, position to defend our country. It's also get a strong strength by the fact of the new resources of energy that we find Western on the Mediterranean. And that has a lot of chances to create new, even in these days, new uh, challenges to the region, some of the countries. The fact we have convened here to discuss Israel is a country with energy resources which provided Israel with economic and environmental advantage, but also extensive geopolitical opportunities is quite new. To illustrate this point, we need to compare the present situation with the one that existed 20 years ago. And as you see the situation 20 years ago on the slide that it's nothing was 
around us. Since its establishment and for decades, Israel was considered a country without energy resources, with no energy of its own, and uh, turned down by many fuel exporting countries in the fear of the Arab boycott. Israel was forced to make painstaking efforts to get the oil it needed to generate electricity, fuel its transportation, and build an industry in a rapidly growing economy. The massive gas field discovered in Israel economic water was followed by deep water gas exploration in the East Mediterranean, leading to important discoveries in Cyprus and later on in Egypt. With the discovery of the Glant Zor Reserve in uh, 2016, which was roughly the same size as Leviathan. Overall, since the start of the decade, gas re a reserve totaling 70 TCF have been discovered, which account for nearly 30% of the global gas discoveries in, at that time. The regional potential, and this is the future opportunities that we are looking about for additional gas reserves, is estimated at between 100 to 300 TCF. That it means that we, with Israel together, the fact that Egypt, Cyprus, and what we are looking now for the future opportunities, the position of the southeast Mediterranean area has become really a strong resources for the future and supply resources of energy for those countries around us and above. So when we are looking, we can see in order to analyze the East Med space, we have to zoom out a little in order to get a broad overview of the region. The Mediterranean re region, region is the only place region is the only place on Earth where three cont cont uh, continents meet and its neighborhood countries can be roughly divided into two. The European one, which is in the blue color, you see the African, North African area in the yellow, and the green one is the Southeast. If you are looking about the list of the countries on the Southeast, you can find here two main countries that, in my opinion, are the changer that can change the area for the tents that just were mentioned before, and I mean Turkey and Lebanon, and we will talk about them later. If, they, if we will be able to join them to those interests of the very strong resources of energy that was found on the sea, it will really will have a strong opportunity to balance the Iranian threat in the area and to create a very strong, uh, I think, uh, considering by those countries whether to bring escalation to the area and it can uh, delay the Iranian activity in our uh, area as well. A study conducted by OME, Observation Mediterranean, the energy, a platform for energy dialogue, cooperation, and best practices exchange, and a think tank of reference in the Euro-Mediterranean reg region shows that over the next few decades, the population of countries surrounding the Mediterranean is expe expected to grow by more than one million uh, people. Uh, 100, I'm sorry, 100 million people. The entire population growth is expected to take place in the countries that lie to the south of the Mediterranean basin. The massive growth in the south Mediterranean population will naturally increase energy needs and shift the demand for energy in this region. And especially will be from the 100 million people, 50% of the, this growth will be in the main two countries of the four Muslim uh, strong countries in the region. I mean Egypt and Turkey, besides Saudi Arabia and of course Iran as the main four Muslim countries. In 1990, the share of the southern Mediterranean countries 
in the aggregate demand for energy was 23% only. According to OEM's uh, estimation, next year, this share will grow up to 40%, while by 2040, the picture will change dramatically when the countries will account for the bulk of the demand for energy. To be accurate, as I said, most of the growth is the in uh, demand for energy will come from the from East Mediterranean countries with Turkey and Egypt representing uh, nearly 50% of the demand. After reviewing the issue from a wide regional perspective, we return to our own neighborhood to perform a strategic bottom-up analysis. The nearest regional layer starts with Israel's close neighbor, Egypt and Jordan, which will soon begin collaborating as Israel begins exporting substantial quantities of natural gas to both Egypt and Jordan. By the way, from 2015, there are small scale exports to Jordanian plants located in the Dead Sea region. And when I talk about Jordan, it's even the fact that these days we are aware about some state, um, statements that were made by the Jordanian king, also visited recently, I think, the United States, that demand, first of all, back from Israel to uh, the, the area that was under the peace agreement signed with Jordan and was staying in Israel's side, and we returned it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and the Jordanian king came, came there by himself to make some observation, looking to the area, some picture for the media, and it looks like there is this asymmetric way to the way that Jordan today is uh, put a future by getting from Israel the most reson uh, uh, resources for its energy. On the other hand, I think that Israeli government, the, I hope new government as soon as possible, will have to balance its relationship with Jordan, which fulfilled a very uh, important task in being like the goalkeeper for the eastern side towards Iraq, Syria, and of course under the Iranian ambitions to this area. So, but on the other end, we see that Jordan, on the very low level, signed with the Israel agreement. And once we talk about these agreements, it's not for one or two years like a ceasefire or something of stopping tense. We are meaning about a generation that we will have to live together and know each other, the interest of the countries. And this is, in my opinion, the strong fact that give us opportunities to create a new area for the Middle East. It's not easy, but Jordan is the first, and Egypt, as I say, is the second one. As a result of this collaboration, Israeli gas will become a dominant factor in the Jordanian energy market and a significant com a component in Egypt, Egypt's energy security. The substantial demand for natural gas in Egypt, both existing and projected together with significant export capabilities by means of gas liquefaction will naturally make Egypt a regional energy hub. On the back, on the back of the regional collaborations between Israel, Egypt, and Cyprus, which aim to secure an uninterrupted supply of energy, we alongside Egypt's dom uh, dominance as a regional hub, an option to export gas from Israel using the East Med pipeline, it's currently reviewed, reviewed. The gas will be transported through Cyprus and Greek all the way to Italy. This is a project that in addition to the economic benefits to the participating countries also has a deep geopolitical di uh, dimension. And when we are talking about the new uh, discussion between Libya and Turkey of divided the economical water, it looks like that uh, Turkey identified these opportunities and put like a, a block that says, without us, you will not be able to do so. That is something to emphasize what I said before. We have to find a way 
to move Turkey on a way to be a partner and take on account these strategic things that are running around our area in order to prevent it, to fail it, and much more quicker is the opportunities to renew the discussions between Israel and Lebanon about the economical water, which will be a, a sensor to prevent or maybe put a lot of difficulties uh, for Hezbollah for being a proxy. We will open a fire towards Israel or something that will serve the Iranian goals in our region uh, easily. It will be much more uh, difficult for them, especially while we are looking about the bubbling social demonstrations inside Lebanon, besides what's going in Iraq and, of course, in Iran, but Lebanon is a very important for the immediate and medium time. Turkey is for the long range. We have to find a way, and I will come to the United States task or I think a very important opportunities to give the umbrella for such a thing. Uh, using exciting liquefaction plants as well as future land-based and sea-based liquefaction plants, gas will be transported to Asian countries from Egypt. It is one opportunity besides before it's the second floor and the third floor will be the pipeline that I just mentioned, leading to a significant increase in the use of natural gas over the next few decades. As a result, and it was mentioned, uh, I think, by Professor Fahim in Bar or uh, maybe Iran, uh, as a result of the developments, the East Med Gas Forum was launched in 2019, led by Egypt. Additional forum members include Israel, Cyprus, Italy, Greek, Jordan, and even the Palestinians that were invited uh, that area. By the way, for these gas resources, there is only also one very close to Gaza that has been a stop for continuing to negotiate with them. It can supply all the gas for the Palestinians, or whether they joined it to the, say, the pipeline to Egypt, it gives them hundreds of billions of dollars per year, and that is just to completely the way the, how we are thinking about developing of lack of money for economical push towards Gaza or to the West Bank. There is a lot of possibilities as well, and I think it was a smart side to invite even the Palestinians to that forum. The forum is established to promote the development of the regional energy sector to ensure the energy security and uh, economic uh, prosperity of neighboring countries. The forum is the first of its kind collaboration between the triple alliance formed by Israel and Egypt over the past few years each separately with Greek and Cyprus. The establishment of this forum is indicative of a turn where the Triple Alliance not only do not turn into complete, uh, competition between the two countries, but rather have shared interest aside from the gas discoveries. This development is also attributed to Turkish growing uh, assertiveness in, uh, in the, like the agreement with Libya, Mediterranean, uh, the concern it creates among the region's countries. And I just would like to conclude my, and to tell. First of all, concerning Israel, if there is such a question, we are able to defend our energy resources, uh, especially in about three weeks while the resources of gas will be divided into two main gas fields. In 2020-21 will be another two gas fields. So it means that even such a take of such a gas field, which is naturally will be one of the targets that the uh, enemies, especially from the Iranian area and Hezbollah will try uh, to target or to strike, we will have enough other opportunities not to close these resources. And we have also alternative as it comes for how we are producing our electricity today. The second issue is the fact that I told, I think that the game changer in our area today for a quick result should be Lebanon. At that field, this forum that was get the umbrella by the American Minister of Energy and the United States has 
their uh, steps and support to Lebanon economically and also to the Lebanese uh, armed forces should, maybe together with France, force and uh, push the Lebanese for this kind of talking with Israel on agreement about the economical water and the side Hezbollah is observing because Hezbollah will have in his, uh, its memory the outcome of the Second Lebanon War while it was very unpopular and even today by the Lebanese memories about the damage to cause to their life and their economical. So Hezbollah has at the end to make a decision between ideologic and the Iranian support that this is really his first reason of, uh, to, be, to be on that uh, in our area, but to the fact that in South Lebanon are living many Shi'is. It's like in Iraq that the most of the demonstrations are done by Shi'is. There is a lot of percentage of population Shi'is in the south of Lebanon, which Rizabala has to decide about his future steps. So I think that in this kind of the energy that I used when I was responsible for being the co coordinator of the government activities to the West Bank and Gaza, I used the simple sentence, economy is security and security is economy. And I think was found in the Mediterranean for the high level of this kind of strategic give us a lot of opportunities and we'll have a lot of chance to prevent any kind of war in our region. Thank you very much. the end of several hours of uh, consideration of uh, the challenges and opportunities in the Eastern Mediterranean. I'm mindful of the fact that um, when I was an undergraduate, there was a Western Civ course that was scheduled in the late afternoon that was rather cruelly known by the students as the decline of interest. And so I will try and um, be at least pro provocative enough to keep everybody uh, interested. About eight years ago, my colleagues at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments and I um, uh, pitched the idea to one of our government sponsors of doing uh, a paper that noted that the balance of power in Southern Europe and the Levant had undergone a tremendous shift uh, and that it might be of interest to the Department of Defense uh, to take a look at, at the area as a potential area for future conflict. And the, the trends that we were worried about were the rise of uh, an are things that have been talked about earlier today, but I'll just quickly tick them off. The rise of a Islamo-nationalist Turkey, uh, the dislocations created by the Arab Spring, U.S. retrenchment in the region, uh, intensifying uh, ideological competition in the region, particularly Sunni Shia, uh, the worsening of, of Turco-Israeli relations. <laughs> Uh, the economics uh, of the region, in, in particular the emergence of a undersea uh, gas and potentially oil economy that's just been described in detail by my predecessors on, on this uh, panel, um, and the potential tensions that that could trigger because of not least Turkey's outsized maritime claims, but the potential of other uh, spoilers to intercede. Um, and the pro proliferation of military technologies that could create some of the anti-access area denial challenges we've seen in other parts of the world, as well as the proliferation of unmanned undersea vehicles and under, un, uh, unmanned autonomous uh, undersea vehicles that could threaten gas and oil platforms, uh, and particularly given uh, the overlapping and conflicting maritime claims, some of which we've heard about, uh, and the fact that they're fairly low barriers to entry uh, for uh, prospective um, recipients of this kind of military technology, including not just states but non-state actors, particularly for the uh, unmanned uh, undersea vehicles, which we've seen, for instance, drug cartels in this hemisphere uh, develop extremely sophisticated uh, activities. The, the um, trends that uh, we were worried about uh, in the study we did eight years ago have intensified uh, over uh, the past few years, in particularly against a backdrop of increasing Russian and Iranian influence and presence in the area. And my predecessor as Undersecretary Doug Feith 
um, in the previous panel discussed uh, some of this, but uh, let me be uh, you know, a bit more specific that the use by Russia uh, at its TARDIS uh, uh, naval base and its uh, air base near Latakia of both uh, Yakant uh, uh, anti sub uh, anti ship cruise missiles, um, the uh, use of the uh, so called caliber cruise missile and SS 26, uh, as he uh, SS 26 missiles, as he noted, the uh, calibers were fired both from the Caspian and from the Eastern Mediterranean by the Russians, as well as the positioning of Bastion B coastal defense missiles uh, around the, the naval base. Uh, have already created an anti-access uh, area denial bubble in, in the eastern Mediterranean that should be of concern uh, to the U.S., but also its friends and allies in, in the region. Um, uh, there's also, of course, been the creation of a permanent operational group uh, of the Russian Navy as part of its Black Sea Fleet has deployed into the eastern Med with a permanent flotilla of about 15 Ships. Now, this is against a backdrop of declining U.S. attention and resources uh, to the eastern Mediterranean region. During the Cold War, uh, when you think back to the Cold War, the eastern Med was actually uh, one of the first places where we confronted uh, Soviet power. If you think about the Turkish Straits crisis of 1946, the Greek-Turkish crisis of 1947, the subsequent creation of the the Sixth Fleet, the initial expansion of NATO to include Greece and Turkey in 1952. Uh, it, it's clear that the Eastern Med was a, a major part of, of U.S. strategy. Um, and, but if you look at the positioning of U.S. naval assets uh, in the Eastern Med, um, and I'll, I'll just go through some numbers for you to just give you a sense of this, uh, it, based on open source data from IISS, in 1985, at the height of the Cold War, the Sixth Fleet had two carrier groups, six submarines, 12 surface combatants, 11 support ships, and one amphibious ready group of three to five ships uh, for the Marines, with a total of about 27,000 personnel. By 1989, as the Cold War was winding down, uh, we were down to one uh, carrier group, four submarines, six to eight surface combatants, four to eight support ships, with a total personnel of about 20,000. In 2016, we were down to four guided missile destroyers based in Rota, Spain, so at the other end of the Mediterranean, um, and four uh, amphibious ships of various types, uh, which were basically available for non-combatant evacuation operations. Uh, so you can see that the US uh, naval presence and the resources devoted to it have uh, dropped significantly. Uh, in his 2017 book, uh, Jim Stavridis, my former colleague in the Department of Defense and the former SAC um, uh, said that we need to think about the Eastern Med as a zone of conflict just like the South China Sea, because many of the same uh, concerns, uh, outsized maritime claims, <coughs> undersea resources, um, uh, are present in, in the Eastern Med as they are in the South China Sea. And he called for increasing the Sixth, sixth Fleet from its current handful of surface combatants to a permanently deployed force of at least uh, 10 ships. Now, that's a great recommendation. I, I agree with it. But it's actually very hard to implement in the context of a shrinking Navy and changing requirements for the Navy's presence overseas. So the National Defense Panel, on which I served in 2014, uh, heard from uh, the then uh, Chief of Naval Operations, Gary Ruffhead, that the Navy, as it was sinking below 300 ships, was not able to maintain its presence requirements globally uh, at, that, at that level. And as a result, that panel um, made the recommendation, famous recommendation now, that the Navy should have 355 ships. I, I won't describe to you the math that went into coming up with the 355 number. It, it, I will promise you it's not science. Um, but it did set a uh, notional aspirational level uh, for a Navy that would be capable of at least meeting the presence requirements. Uh, and it was adopted by uh, President Trump in his September 2016 speech in Philadelphia as, as, the, as the aspiration. Now, that's going to be hard to achieve in the context of the uh, flat and declining uh, budget numbers that we are going to start seeing next year 
uh, as the two-year budget deal expires. Uh, we're now looking at, after two years under President Trump of increases, uh, healthy increases in the defense budget, at a defense budget that's likely to decline by about 1.7 percent in real terms. Uh, so the ability to actually execute um, an increase in, in resources, particularly as the national security strategy and national defense strategy uh, prioritize at the expense of the uh, Middle East, uh, East Asia, and Europe, uh, it, it's uh, going to be very challenging uh, to, to come up with um, the resources to do that. What, what are some uh, other opportunities? We've heard a lot about the declining U.S.-Turkish relationship uh, during the course of the afternoon. I, I won't go over that ground again, although I'm happy to discuss it in, in the question and answer period. But as U.S.-Turkish relations have declined, it has opened up an opportunity to improve uh, our relations with Greece, which uh, heretofore had not been one of the better NATO allies. But interestingly, uh, including under the previous government, certainly under the current government, has made an increasing investment in NATO and made it clear that it's open to a, a greater activity with NATO, um, including um, hosting uh, alliance exercises, use of the naval base at Crete, uh, and those uh, opportunities ought to be exploited by the United States as much as possible. Uh, we've heard uh, in the last three presentations about uh, the increasing regional cooperation among Cyprus, Greece, Egypt, and Israel. Uh, that obviously is something that ought to be a focus uh, of U.S. Uh, diplomacy. And, and I would say, although I, I'm pleased to hear from Iran that uh, Secretaries uh, Pompeo and, and, um, and Perry attended uh, sessions of the forum, this, this can't just be episodic. Uh, it needs to be a much more uh, uh, focused and disciplined uh, uh, diplomatic, uh, diplomatic uh, effort. A and there, I'm, I'm afraid we have some very serious bureaucratic hurdles to overcome, which I'll, I'll come back to. Uh, even as we increase uh, cooperation with, with Greece and regional cooperation among uh, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Egypt, and, and Israel, uh, we will also have to perforce manage uh, Turkey for the reasons that uh, Doug said uh, earlier uh, in the last panel which is that Turkey remains, there's no mechanism for uh, uh, kicking Turkey out of NATO, despite the fact that it has been for at least a decade a very unreliable um, NATO ally. <clears throat> but, uh, but it remains a, a crucially important country. We ought to remember that it's a, it's not, um, it is not a synonymous with a Recep Tayyip Erdogan. It's a deeply divided country, and Erdogan has never really represented uh, more than 50 percent of the country. So I think we have to play a very uh, long game uh, with, uh, with Turkey, focusing on increasing the costs of pursuing the bad behavior that uh, the Erdogan regime has uh, pursued, uh, while holding open the uh, option of cooperation um, and, um, uh, and better relations uh, in, in the face of a different uh, direction from Turkey. One thing that I have advocated uh, in print uh, earlier is that we uh, start looking for alternatives to Interlik. I wouldn't pull out of Interlik yet, but we ought to uh, make it clear to, uh, to Turkey that uh, it's not too big to fail, that the United States does have alternatives, uh, whether they be in the UAE or on Cyprus or, uh, or in Greece. Uh, and um, we ought to target the sanctions um, against Turkey uh, on the uh, S-400 uh, transaction itself, which is sanctionable under CATSA, uh, because Rosa Braun Export, the Russian agency that uh, conducts the uh, export of, of these missiles, is a sanctioned entity, um, and on Erdogan and his cronies. Uh, but not, I would say, threaten the entire Turkish economy, as the president did in a, a tweet uh, uh, on multiple occasions. Uh, because that has the effect of creating a, a kind of existential threat to Turkey that, uh, rather than playing on the divisions that exist, as I was suggesting earlier, actually unifies the country behind, behind Erdogan. We have, as I said, bureaucratic hurdles that we need to um, overcome. And in the first instance, in order to have, I think, effective diplomacy, given 
uh, particularly the prospects that have been described by my fellow panelists uh, earlier this afternoon, we need to think about the Eastern Mediterranean as a coherent uh, stra a strategic whole. And that is extremely difficult in our system, both because of the divisions uh, that are created by the unified command plan between UCOM and CENTCOM, with Turkey and the UCOM side, um, and uh, Israel not in CENTCOM, uh, but the rest of the region in CENTCOM, but also in the organization of the Department of State between uh, the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs uh, and, the, and the Bureau of European Affairs. We, uh, one thing that has happened, which I think is to be commended, and Hudson, um, I think, uh, deserves particular praise for this. Uh, there have been a series of studies, uh, one that uh, Doug mentioned that um, Hudson and the University of Haifa have uh, done on the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, a task force that I co-chair with General Chuck Wald, uh, the former uh, deputy uh, 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 SAC Ewer, uh, for JINSA, that's looked at the Eastern Mediterranean, um, and one by CSIS. So there is a growing consensus, at least in the think tank world, that uh, the Eastern Med has to be seen as a coherent strategic whole. Uh, but I'm not sure that that has completely percolated uh, uh, throughout the US government. L luckily for, for us, we happen to have, in my view, some very talented uh, professional diplomats uh, working in some of these places. So, uh, and I've actually been in touch with Ambassador Pyatt uh, in Greece, who, who I think has noticed all of these uh, think tank reports and is uh, anxious to uh, make the best of them, but also, also Ambassador Judith Garber in Cyprus and Ambassador, Ambassador Jonathan Cohen in Egypt. So we have people who I think are very capable of uh, executing a, a coherent, consistent policy towards the Eastern Med, but we have to, um, in fact, I think make sure that they have a policy to execute and a process that leads to that. Um, finally, um, we do have to give some attention to the potential spoilers. Uh, Turkey, of course, is, is one of them. I've already discussed that. Uh, Iran, uh, as has been mentioned by others, uh, through its proxies, is another potential spoiler. Um, and uh, although I agree with Doug that the administration has done admirable work with the maximum pressure campaign, very effectively wielding the sanctions uh, tools against Iran, I think on the issue of pushback against uh, Iran's proxies in the region, the record is uh, much uh, spottier. Uh, and less consistent. Um, and, and there, I think, we have to uh, put more emphasis on consistently, and that goes to the point about Lebanon that was made earlier, but also in Syria, where the President's decisions, uh, I think, have actually had the un unfortunate impact of um, diminishing U.S. leverage over the ultimate uh, diplomatic disposition of in Syria, um, and uh, therefore, uh, limited our ability to affect one of the potential spoilers of this otherwise uh, exciting set of prospects that we've heard about uh, with regard to the energy economy transforming the region, not least because while everybody else has been staking out their claims uh, and exploring in, in, the, um, in the Eastern Med for, for gas and potentially oil, although no major oil finds have been found yet, we do know, historically, oil and gas do tend to be co-located, so there's a prospect for oil as well. Uh, but Syria is also a uh, Mediterranean littoral state. It has its own claims uh, and own areas, uh, potentially, to explore. Um, and therefore, we need to have some say in what ultimately um, happens in the disposition of Syria. I'm sorry to say, I think the United States has limited its ability to, to speak in, in that um, forum. We have time for questions. Uh, again, uh, would you please, when recognized, um, tell us who you are, your organization, and um, to whom your question is addressed? All right? And wait for the mic. <laughs> My name's uh, Nathan Stamps. I'm with Representative Gus Bilirakis. Um, I was curious, um, I, I know that in the first panel I'll talk about the United States pivot from the, uh, I guess, the Eastern Mediterranean region, maybe in the Middle East, but I feel like there's been a lot of investment, whether it be American companies in the Eastern Med with the energy 
uh, a lot of work with Greece, building the defense, and uh, especially Ambassador Pyatt's efforts in Greece with that. Um, and hopefully with the Eastern Med Energy and Security Cooperation Act that's passed through the Senate Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations Committee. Um, regarding that, obviously the elephant in the room is Turkey. And so ways that we can incentivize Turkey is sanctions. We can try to do diplomatic efforts, but uh, the latter isn't really working. Um, you're talking about doing, I guess, light touch type of sanctions. Uh, what is your opinion and maybe the, the panel's opinion on trying to marry some of their uh, disruptions in the region, uh, particularly the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, to you know the greater, I guess, sanctions of the S-400, the existing sanctions we have? Well, I, I wouldn't say that I'm in favor of a light touch. I'm in favor of actually pretty strong sanctions, but targeted. So uh, that it it um, accentuates the um, uh, splits that already exist in, in uh, Turkish uh, politics, uh, in in the hope that we're going to get some better outcome ultimately uh, than Erdogan. I mean, as long as Erdogan is there, frankly, I don't think there's much we can do to make him, you know, act in, in a more constructive way. Uh, in part because, as the first panel noted. Um, uh, this is deeply um, personal for Erdogan because it's all tied to his domestic political agenda, uh, and even as Professor Inbar said, to his you know broader <coughs> neo-Ottoman agenda, which is inextricably linked to his domestic you know agenda. So I don't think that there's much we can do ultimately with Erdogan other than create uh, a lot of. Uh, you know, costs that he might want to shed and therefore move in a slightly different direction. But we're never going to get a fully reliable uh, Turkey under under Erdogan. It's just not in the cards because too much of what he depends on uh, for his political support is uh, antipathy to to the U.S., antipathy to Israel, antipathy to the West. It's it's part of the worldview that he comes out of, which is essentially a Muslim Brotherhood worldview, and he's never going to you know move beyond that, in my view. If I may add, um, although there was some language about destroying the Turkish economy and the U.S. You know, saying that we're not an ally of the U.S. and so on, I think that's what you say in your last word. Uh, but um, that threat is very real. The Turkish economy is fragile. And Erdogan's or, or the AKP's position has been very largely based on what it has been able to deliver for a very broad section of Turkish society over the last few years, but what he has produced is also the consequences of what already happened to him in the Istanbul election could become much more severe. So the, uh, the uh, any uh, threat of effective uh, pressure over his head, I think it could be used. In the context of the uh, intricate Libyan-Turkish if this remains uh, a line on the map in the fantasy world, that's one thing. If there is an actual attempt to block Egypt, Israel, Egypt, and, and Cyprus from doing business with Europe, um, the U.S. could be very clear. The Europeans have already come out of the Middle East very uh, sharply worded response. There should be a very clear message. This is I agree with that. If necessary, if, if that's what it takes, there needs to be a shift in American policy vis-a-vis the Middle East and Turkey. Uh, this is what uh, Erdogan does uh, with his critical clients. Maybe he has no shift in his policy. I want to add a few words about the involvement of uh, American companies in the area. Um, I will start with that, that uh, I think there is no other company in the world that contributes to Israel, private company, like Nobel Energy. From next year, Israel will have the ability to produce more energy than all our needs for energy. I don't think... It's something amazing, you know, for as an Israeli that till 15 years ago, no one 
actually thought, thought about resources in, in Israel. But uh, as I say that, I don't understand why uh, I don't see more American companies work in the NP sector in Israel. Uh, you can think maybe it's uh, from economic uh, reasons, but it's not. They work in Cyprus, they work in Egypt, but not in Israel, okay? And I think that, um, I don't know, maybe they're afraid to have some, you know, that uh, in some places in the Arab world, uh, it will make problems for them. I don't know. I can understand it, yeah, but maybe. But today there is, uh, uh, the, the time is changing. You know, Israel today in the energy sector uh, work deeply with the, uh, the Arab world, with Jordan. Half of the electricity in Jordan will produce from Israeli gas that produced actually by American operator. It's amazing. And we work deeply uh, and close with the Egyptians. So I really want to see more American companies to be involved in the Israeli industry. Um, I, think, I think that, um, of course, it needs to be from economic reasons, but I think uh, behind the economic reasons, it's with the uh, interest of Israel and the state uh, to, to have this cooperation in the private sector, in the ENP uh, potential that there is in Israel. Questions, yeah. Hi, my name is Emily Meredith. I'm a reporter with Energy Intelligence. Um, and I th was hoping maybe Mr. Foster, Mr. Um, Danga, you could explain if you could be more specific about the role you would want the United States to play in terms of fostering Eastern Mediterranean gas development. And then also if you could just speak a little bit about whether geopolitical risk is the biggest problem um, We've already heard some financial players, both private and you know the EBRD, saying that financing would be very difficult for something like the pipeline. So if you could speak to those two issues, that would be great. Can you ask, uh, can you uh, say again the first question, please? I didn't. Sure. Um, just more specific about the role you would want the United States to play in um, policies to foster Eastern Mediterranean gas development. Maybe I will start with the. I, the strategic level. First of all, as I said, the way that United States is like centralized or give its umbrella to the form of the Mediterranean, it gives a lot, I think, of protect, uh, protection to this form and these countries, and it's very important concerning the threat, as you see, from Turkey, from other side. The United States' involvement is also like a balance towards Russia, which we didn't mention it, but Russia, besides the fact they are in Syria and looking to the Mediterranean, there is a look to Russia, from Russia towards Libya and other areas. So for them, it's very interesting. So the issue of the from together, of the ideas of, uh, let's say, a exporting the, the gas issue and the, the other is besides the fact the potential, as Amir mentioned before, of bringing American companies to the area and try to have another, uh, let's say, achievements by identification of another gas uh, resources. And you know, always when the United States is in the area in somewhere, as we are used to, the things are changed. All the others, let's say, wings that are against or something that have another ambitions are calculating their step in, in another way. So. I hope that that form under the United States participation with the minister or others will continue. And also the United States has, as I said, to open the gates towards Europe and other from the Mediterranean by, I think it's the major player towards our one, as it was mentioned, with the, the alternative that we have, positive and negative points, with him, he's an unexpected leader in some way, 
Uh, it has the more chance to speed up the process and to let it open because the resources for this project, like the pipeline from Israel to Italy, it has a lot of invest of uh, billions of uh, dollars in that issue, will convince other countries in the European Union to join it. Um, if, if, if I uh, just add a, a short thing, I think that um, it's really important the, the umbrella of the US um, but you know the, the the relations on the ground floor between the our industry in Israel, the uh, Egyptian industry, the Cypriot industry, is really really good. Uh, I think that um, I don't know what what you think about you know relations between Israeli and Egyptian, but. The relations are really, really good on the ground uh, level, and it's. I think it's because that um, you know when when the economic interest, when the en energetic interest are the same, all the other is really, really easy. So um, I, I think we are just in initial stage of all this uh, development. Um, and again, from the private point of view, uh, the private company's point of view, I will be really happy to see more American companies to be involved and to um, make these uh, relations even better in the area. I, I would like to make one more remark. Is concerning, besides the energy issue, it's all the United States policy in our area. We were sometimes like the ambassador towards the United States, towards supply, let's say, or supporting Jordan or Egypt. And as you know, Sisi was not uh, such a favorite at the beginning of his years here in uh, Washington. And I think that calculating all the strategic policy towards the area and taking into account the situation now with energy and the others should make the United States to bring more, let's say, insurance for a country like Egypt that gives this a way to look for a generation and above and to make such, uh, let's say, agreements with us. By the way, the relationship between Israel and Egypt, it, uh, was, it was very cold during the peace process, after the peace process was signed, the agreement, etc. Today, I think that is the war and the best. I'm not mean from the level of the population of uh, tourism, etc. But today, coordination, cooperation in the levels of economy, and of course from the military side, is joined together to such highest level that we never faced since the peace agreement was signed. I hope with Jordan it will return, and I'm not so. I'm sure it can be corrected. And above all, the West flag is coming from the United States to this area. And Egypt has a lot of depend on the United States for its economical. Russia is on the door already, you know, not to change the, the arsenal of arms of the, of the Egyptians, to give them the insurance that they can go on on this way. And this is one of the, to complete what I said on the level of the energy. Political risk is certainly an element of that, but uh, even for the PBRD, it is very much a question of risk. It's very much a question of where Brussels is going to come down on this. Um, if you consider the opportunity cost of not doing business with Egypt, for example, what could be the consequences for Europe of a major crisis in Egypt down the road, I should hope that. People in Brussels will be, uh, let's say, far-sighted enough to help <coughs> the financial institutions understand the consequences of what might happen if they do not extend the necessary aid in order to secure the risk possible. Because for all of us, if anything really bad happens in Egypt, we will get pretty close in terms of risk. So um, the, the, the cost 
very new practical thought which we are in now. After, after, after gas is flowing in the pipelines, after the two countries benefit from that, I think the price, the losing price that you have is going, um, can be higher and higher. So to go back from that, it's more difficult. That's, that's one of the things that I can, uh, that I think that natural gas pipeline can be a real uh, stabilized factor in the area. We have time for one more question. Hello? Um, <clears throat> thank you. Hello, Hello Fratkin of the Hudson Institute. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. One, one is, I think, primarily to Alouf uh, Dangot uh, concerning his remarks about what, how Israel understands the vulnerability of of the gas fields and uh, and how it approaches. I wasn't really sure I understood what you were trying to say about that, and, and that's just the, the the question. The other question relates, I think, a little bit to what just came up when. Uh, in Aaron's uh, remarks, and, and that is one issue that is often talked about with regard to the East Med, but didn't come up here in any direct way, is the issue of uh, refugee flows to Europe, uh, in as much as the Eastern Med is the, the main highway of that, uh, whether that's from a, a crisis in Egypt or it's a crisis elsewhere, or the degree to which Turkey has uh, very hypocritically used it. Uh, and I was wondering, it's a kind of general question, whether you have any reflections on what, what this new cooperation that you've been speaking about what might lead to in terms of a policy to handle this, because it seems to me very much ad hoc at the moment. If I just uh, understand your question about the way of military defending the areas of the gas fields, yeah, I will start with a fact that happened a few months ago, one of the escalation with uh, Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The, our Minister of Energy took a decision to stop operate the only gas field that uh, is locating in the uh, north part of Israel, not far from Haifa, Tamar, but its pipe is going not far from Gaza to Ashkelon. That is the way it's collecting uh, the gas. And something like this has 
an impact, first of all, of one of the winning pictures of Hamas. You know, for small escalation, they stop the main energy resources to the Israel civilians. Secondly, for us, it's a damage to finance economy, what you pay for the alternative each day. So the solution is start now with the new deployment of gas fields. It means this, the second uh, Leviathan gas field that will be operated in about two weeks, I think, from now. It's al already will divide between few places. And then 2021, we'll add another two. So we'll have four. With four uh, gas fields, you have a lot of opportunities to cover each other. And let's say that the chances to stop it as it happened now are very low. Secondly, concerning each gas field about its location and the way, I can tell you that, of course, the military staff, especially the Navy intelligence, is a part of the team that are doing where and uh, which is the distance, etc. The Naval strength itself with some uh, reconnaissance ship, I can call it, that will have area. We don't have a, such a big Navy, of course, as our colleagues from Egypt or from uh, Turkey, for example, but it will cover this area. Besides, it's each gas field will have its uh, defend by systems like Iron Dome and uh, even the, let's say, the strategic system to defend against a direct rocket or a missile that can come. You have to, to target a gas field. It's not so easy. You have to be very specific with the war. And one of the things now, just to, carry with the, to compare it, is the fact that Israel took as a strategic offensive way to attack each uh, alt uh, activity of Iran and the Hezbollah of improving their uh, warheads of missile rockets, etc. It starts from yes, from uh, Iran in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon. The last achievement was in the Dahia itself. Well, in the last minute, we succeed to, let's say, to delay. I'm not sure to prevent, but to delay their activities. This is with a lot of intelligence which suit to the new position concerning these threats. For example, his, uh, Hamas from Gaza, it, by the way, its naval power is trained by Turkey. It's not a secret. Turkey is training their people, uh, Hamas, to be able to make, you know, submariners and this kind of thing. So good intelligence, good air defense against it. The Navy has its uh, way of to defend. It give, I think, the most support uh, to do it seven, 24 hours, seven days a week. Thank you. Um, <coughs> it's been an excellent discussion. Uh, two panels. I'd like to thank Dan, Ephraim, Chai, um, Ron, Amir, Etan, Eric, and Doug in absentia uh, for uh, excellent presentations this afternoon. And um, I hope this is uh, not the last time that we're able to get together and discuss this issue. Thank you all. Standing Jerusalem. <laughs>